Hey, folks, Ruby Receptionists is a virtual receptionist service. That means you forward your existing business phone number to one of their friendly receptionists in Portland, Oregon, who answers on your behalf. Just like the old days, smart technology shows them the details about your business and your callers before they pick up the phone so they sound like they're sitting right there in your office. More importantly, Ruby receptionists care about connecting with your callers and making their day while making your business look good. Yeah. Get started today at callruby.com slash WTF and get free activation, a $98 value. All right, let's do the show. Lock the gate. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers, what the fuck buddies, what the fucking ears, what the fuckaholics, what's happening? I'm Mark Marin. This is my show, my podcast, WTF. Welcome to it. Thank you for joining me. If you are new to the show, or if you're not, you've picked a hell of a day. My guest is uh, the film director, William Friedkin, who I was ecstatic to talk to. I had made this, this guy was a mythic being in my head. I don't know when you saw The French Connection or The Exorcist. I don't know when you saw either of those movies. But when I saw the when I saw The French Connection, I think I saw it when it opened. Somehow or another, maybe my parents took me to an R-rated movie. Would they have done that? Yes. I mean, I was I was eight years old. Would they have done that instead of get a babysitter? Probably. I bet you they did. Because I feel like I saw it when it came out and it scarred my brain. It was one of those sort of portals into a underworld, into a sort of grittiness that I was not supposed to see at eight. I guess maybe if I lived in that neighborhood, if I lived in New York or Queens, maybe maybe that would have been my reality. But no, I was I think I was an eight year old kid living in New Jersey or that point, Alaska, Anchorage. But I saw it and there were certain things that resonated with me that I, that I could never get out of my brain. Gene Hackman being one of them. Just Gene Hackman as a force of nature. Oh, my God. Changed my brain. Then The Exorcist, of course. When, yeah, for some reason, the stuff that stands out in my mind is not the puking. It's not the cussing. It's when she started talking like the priest's mom. That that was haunting. Whole goddamn thing was haunting. But he, of course, directed Brink's Job, Cruising, Deal of the Century. I remember uh, seeing. I remember 1985. When I was in college, very excited when uh, To Live and Die in L.A. came out. Because me and my buddy Devin were film heads, and we were very uh, Friedkin-oriented. And you know, more recently, he's directed a couple of uh, Tracy Letts' plays, Bug and Killer Joe, which were pretty unruly, pretty amazing. There's, there's quite a few movies here. But the one that always took this sort of you know mythic presence in my head, again, I'm going to throw that word around a bit, mythic. William Friedkin. He was one of the fucking dirty 70s directors, man. He was like, he was, a, had the swagger. I just, you know, I never knew what it'd be like to talk to him. I never thought I'd have an opportunity in my life to talk to him. But Sorcerer was always the, the film you heard about. The film that, you know, cost all this money that, that people said was either self-indulgent or did, people didn't see it. Well, I saw it recently for the first time and it's a great fucking movie. It's out on Blu-ray now. It's a, it's, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's a movie based on The Wages of Fear, which is a, a French film, I, I believe. Uh, I didn't see it. I know some people are like, well, you know, it's not as good as The Wages of Fear. Fine. I didn't see that. I saw a Sorcerer with Roy Scheider, and it was, uh, it was fucking awesome. And that new print is just awesome. And I talked to William Friedkin a lot about that. But man, the first time I saw The French Connection, Jesus. If you're a business owner, you know that your company is only as good as the people you hire. Posting jobs in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. And if you have a small business like me, you don't have time to post on dozens of job sites. ZipRecruiter is the solution. You can post to more than 100 job sites with a single click. That means the job you're looking to fill will be instantly matched to candidates for more than 6 million resumes. And ZipRecruiter sets you up with an easy-to-use system that allows you to track the new candidates as they roll 
roll in within 24 hours. ZipRecruiter has been used by more than 400,000 businesses, and here's one reason why. This is an email from Dan. He wrote, quote, The hardest part about running a business when you need to hire someone is that you have to spend extra time recruiting while you're short-staffed. But with ZipRecruiter, I've gotten quality candidates within 24 hours of posting a job. ZipRecruiter's website makes this process so much faster by letting me manage candidates in one place. Unquote. Today you can try ZipRecruiter for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Marin. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Marin. Get staffed up. William Friedkin, man. I was nervous. You know, this dude's, uh, you know, he's been around. He's done a lot of stuff. He, he never stops working. He directs operas now. But I'm telling you, man, if you're my age, even if you're not my age, if you were obsessed with that crew, from the 70s, the guys that changed it all, that changed American film forever. You know, I read that, that whatever that book is, what is it, uh, Ra- Easy Riders and Raging Bulls. I mean, whether it's uh, all on, on point or not, I don't know, but I'll give you some historical context to this idea that in the late 60s, the Hollywood infrastructure, the guys who were making movies, they were a lot of old guys that had been in place since the studio system. And they didn't, uh, they no longer knew what the hell Americans wanted to see or to watch. And the Vietnam War was starting and going on. And during this time, you know, they were at a loss. They were at odds. They, they're, a transition needed to happen and they didn't know exactly how to do it. Now I'm paraphrasing the whole historical idea of this book and I might be wrong, but it's my understanding that there was a window of opportunity in the late sixties for a lot of young directors to do almost whatever the fuck they wanted because the older executives didn't know what the fuck to do. And that's where you get your George Lucas, your Spielberg, your Coppola, your Hal Ashby, uh, Scorsese, your Friedkin, uh, Bogdanovich, Bob Raffleson, even some Altman. Yeah, I would even argue that, you know, Peckinpah, early Peckinpah, when he shifted out of making uh, studio movies, uh, that those type of studio movies. But I would argue, listen to me, like, uh, like anyone's calling me on this, but Friedkin was one of them. And I never knew his story. And uh, it's kind of fascinating how he got a feel for a camera. And, and these all these movies, the ones that I really remember seeing when I was younger because my parents would let me see movies or they'd take me movie, to the movies was Five Easy Pieces or The Last Detail or Shampoo or um, Easy Rider, which I didn't love. I didn't, there was a part in that movie. I liked a lot of it, but that commune part I could do without. But The French Connection, man. The French Connection. I watched it again recently, twice. Holds up. When you really think about that car chase and that character and the intensity of that character in that car chase, based on true story, but Roy Scheider's in it and Gene Hackman, a young Gene Hackman. Fucking Gene Hackman, man. And I talked to Friedkin about that casting choice. I mean... Nothing happens like you think it happens. You know, we see these movies, they, they imprint themselves in our minds, and we think that they, you know, that had to be the guy for the role. There was no other guy. In, in our mind, it's one, all the stories don't matter because you don't know them. You just see this movie and it's perfect, and you think like that had to happen exactly the way it happened without knowing how it actually happened. So getting the opportunity to talk to William Friedkin about how this stuff happened. I just watched uh, his most recent films, Bug and uh, Killer Joe, which were out there. But Tracy Letts, the playwright, is he's out there. And it, they're great. But how do you sort of tap into, and I've talked to directors. I'd like to talk to more directors. They're really actually the hardest guests to get on here. And I love talking to them because as a film goer, like I said, you just take in these pieces of art and these these films in their entirety as what they are and you don't really realize the intelligence or struggles or or vision that went into it necessarily and and a lot of times it's not as i said it's not what you think happened or what you would assume would have happened but man talking to freaking what a trip what a treat and a trip We want to thank Squarespace today for sponsoring this episode and for supporting WTF over the years. One of the things Squarespace is known for is support, because if you need a website for any reason, Squarespace is the way to do it. They'll give you everything you need to build a beautiful site, and they have 24-7 online help if you need it. That's support, 24-7. 
It doesn't matter why you need to build a website. Squarespace makes it simple, giving you a powerful and beautiful website that looks professionally designed no matter what. So whatever you're selling, whatever you want to display, whatever you need to promote, it will all look great on every computer and device thanks to Squarespace. We hear from a lot of WTF listeners thanking us for turning them on to Squarespace, and we always tell them, don't thank us, thank Squarespace. They made it easy for you. So what are you waiting for, people? Start a trial with no credit card required and start building your website today. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code WTF to get 10% off your first purchase and to show your support for this show. So without further ado, since this is a long one, this is me and the uh, the master of uh, filmmaking, Mr. William Friedkin, talking right here in this garage. There's no filters here, Mr. Freak. I understand. Freakin. I've heard the podcast. You I, have? I know there's no filters, other than my own self-imposed filters. Yes. Well, we all have those, I guess. Oh, yeah. So, uh-huh. I, I've i been... Uh, you know what I did uh, in order... It's very... When I was in high school, I mean, I'm 52, so I, I missed in real time, I think, as a grown-up, the early movies. But I remember, like, uh, we were all very excited all the time when you were putting out a new movie, me and my friend Devin, who was sort of a film head. But uh, I watched for the first time uh, Sorcerer, the director's cut, on the plane. I, I, I rented it and I watched it because I'd heard about it. Uh, you know, it's, it's a legendary movie. And I watched it for the first time and I, I thought it was a fucking masterpiece. Well, thank you. That's not the best way to see it. <laughs> no, I know, of course not. But I mean, it's what the are, worst way to see it. What are my opportunities? What are my options? What would you have? It's a beautiful Blu ray. Oh, yeah? Fantastic. I mean, looks better than any print of the film. Well, I just wanted to get to, you know, the, see it the best I can and, and see it, you know, compared to like uh, French Connection, The Exorcist, and that early, that sort of that tone you were getting back then. Mm-hmm. And to feel what, because uh, I'd, I'd only heard about, I think it's one of those movies where initially people didn't respond well, and then now people who are smart realize that they fucked up. Do you find that that's the case? It's new people. Uh huh. It's different people. The film came out in 1977. Yeah. And the zeitgeist was different. Uh huh. And now the zeitgeist has changed radically, but there's still some people who look to discover stuff that was made before the last few years. By the real guys. Well, <laughs> the real guys were before me, Mark. Who do you consider them to be? Orson Welles. Yeah. Uh, Billy Wilder, George yeah. Stevens, uh-huh. uh, William Wyler, uh, uh, the French New Wave, yeah. who were fantastic, the Italian neorealists. There's nobody around today making movies like that. Like Antonioni or uh, Fellini, Truffaut, Godard, Fellini. All those guys. Yeah, yeah. They um, really threw the switch. Uh-huh. And it's a different world today, completely different. Most of the people going to films today don't know who we're talking about. Isn't that, it's, it's a shame, isn't it? No. It, th- things change. Do you, are, do you really have peace around that idea? Oh, absolutely. Things change. As you get older, you watch them slowly change and manifest into something else. But I still think change is a diplomatic word when you look at the quality of some things that are happening. I mean, can you really name a, a dozen movies as a guy who's still on the pulse uh, that compare to the movies of the people that you just spoke of? I can't. Okay. But some people I, may. Well, I mean, okay. no, I still watch the same stuff I always love. Yeah. It's like listening to a piece of music. Mm-hmm. You know, you seldom tire right. of a piece of music, whether it's pop or classical or rock, whatever, mm-hmm. that you once loved. Right. You you find different things in it. So I tend to watch the films that influenced and inspired me, and I get more out of them. The way I continue to listen to one particular recording of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, right? Uh, conducted by a guy named Carlos Kleiber, mm-hmm. uh, must have been made in the... 70s uh-huh. or 80s with the Vienna Philharmonic. And I can listen to that recording. I've listened to it hundreds of times. And I hear different things in it every yeah. time I listen. Yeah. That's what happens when I see a film like Citizen Kane right. or The Verdict. 
Uh, the, I just, I'm compulsive about the verdict. Verdict is one of the oh great. Oh, my God. That's a masterpiece. That's that, an insane movie. Yeah, it's the greatest. And, it, and to find new things in something so subtle. Oh, yeah. Little moments. Uh-huh. Little ticks. Uh, little things on the soundtrack. Oh, yeah. A moment that uh, Paul Newman takes, or James Mason. Yeah. Which is, it's a legendary uh, film, and I just love it. But there's such an intelligence to it. Like in something like this, uh, uh, Sorcerer, I mean, that obviously was a personal journey, uh, not only as a director, but I imagine in your heart and in your mind and whatever the hell you were dealing with that as a person, that you were going to move through these characters that, that you, you know, they real, they revealed a certain amount and there was a certain amount of, uh, surrealism to the setting in a way that way, you know, why did they all end up there? There, there are things that, you, you know, were obviously poetic and metaphorical, I think, but, uh, but it, it assumed that, that the audience was there to see a piece of art in a way. I mean, it was not a, uh, you, you know, it wasn't something that you weren't on some level worried about, like, you know, well, there's a narrative hole here. No, that's correct. I wasn't trying to make art, ever. I was just trying to tell stories on film. Uh-huh. And I love the medium. Uh-huh. And what got me into it was when I first saw Citizen Kane. Well, wait, where, where'd you grow up? Chicago. Really? I lived in Chicago for the first 20 odd years of my life jewish right? family jewish family religious uh yes they were um i was bar mitzvah uh-huh uh but i don't come away feeling close to um the jewish faith like in a synagogue or right, something right. like that i'm much more drawn and have been for years to the teachings of jesus yeah not through the Catholic Church, yeah, but just through the New Testament, it's a, it's which a, I also continue to read. It's a simpler poetry in a way. It's beautiful. Yeah, words to live by. Yeah, you know, the Old and, Testament's a lot fragmented, not a, not a straight narrative. It's so. difficult to read. <laughs> a lot of stories. Some yeah. of the New Testament yeah. reads like journalism. Yeah, yeah. The Book of Mark mm -hmm. when he describes the crucifixion, it's like you are there. You can experience it through. Whoever wrote the Book of Mark. Did you ever think about telling that story on film? No, it's been done. Uh, yeah, I know. Not too badly. By? But, well, uh, Mel, Mel Gibson's yeah. film, The oh, Passion yeah. of the Christ, was a powerful experience. Yeah, it was. And But there's more to just a Christ than the crucifixion. Yeah. I've seen The Shroud of Turin. Mm -hmm. I've been to Turin many times, and I just finished directing an opera there. I just did Aida in uh, at the Teatro Reggio in Torino. How many have you been doing? A lot of operas. I've done about fifteen operas since nineteen ninety eight. You understand Italian? I have to understand whatever language I'm doing the opera in. The libretto. I uh -huh. have to completely understand the libretto. While I might not be able to order a ham sandwich mm -hmm. in the language, you know. <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, uh, you do have to learn the libretti, and I for do. the story. I, oh, I, I, yeah. I study them, uh -huh. and I get my inspiration for the productions that I set up through directly from the music and the libretto. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not something I make up. Right, like a film is generally sometimes there's a script, sometimes not. But when you're filming it, you're making it up. And and you got and, shot by shot, right? And and each shot is different in a way. Like with an opera, I guess each performance is different. But once you set, you know, once you get everything set in motion, you're hoping that uh, outside of perhaps an amazing performance by the performers, that shit holds together. And that it, <laughs> oh yeah, it's pretty well um, planned and rehearsed. Yeah. Whereas I don't rehearse a film. Well, that's why you get that raw feeling. I'm interested in cinema mm -hmm. in um, spontaneity. And spontaneity comes from working with the actors before you ever get to the set. Mm -hmm. You become, a, in, in, in the way I work, sort of like, I guess, what a psychologist does. Sure. And you will talk to the actor. You'll find yeah. out what it is that moves he or she, him or her emotionally yeah? from their past. Do you do that? Oh, yeah. And like, how would something like that go? Like, say, because you got a I'll hell of... I'll give you an example. Okay. Well, just tell, How about Ashley Judd? Because you got a hell of a performance out of her and Bug. Hell well, of a performance. It's more graphic if I tell you how I worked okay, go with ahead. Hackman. Well, Hackman was young, right? The, which Younger. Mm -hmm. The French Connection. Yep. And in talking to Gene, mm -hmm. I 
found out from him, and you have to give up a lot of your own information when you do this, mm. but I found out that he grew up in a town called Dundee, Illinois, mm -hmm. which was near the Indiana border, mm -hmm. and there were Ku Klux Klan guys around. And it was a extremely right-wing conservative area. Mm -hmm. And his father left the family when Gene was young. So, consequently, he wanted to fight this um, prejudice that he grew up with, and he hated his father. Mm -hmm. He hated his father. Once For I leaving. realized that, yeah. I knew that I could get to his anger by becoming his father. Even though I was 10 years younger than Gene, I was the authority figure right. on the French Connection. Yeah. And Gene did not want to go to the dark places of that character. He he fought that most through most of his youth and all of his adult life. Uh -huh. Not go back to that mouse inside the elephant. Yeah. And I realized that he had to show this anger and the cop he was playing was uh, performing the role of a racist cop in New York in order to survive. Right. These guys were guys who made their living among the dead. Yeah. And in order to survive, they had to be tough guys and, in fact, come off like racists. And Gene did not want to go there. He was not my first choice for that part. Who was? Uh, Jackie Gleason. The, the really? The studio would not go with Gleason. And then I wanted uh, Peter Boyle, who had just okay. made a film called Joe. Yeah. And I found out that by treating Gene harshly, in fact, cruelly, on the set, I could get to his anger. And a lot of what motivated that character was the appearance of anger. He had to appear to be very angry. Yeah. In fact, the guy was not really a tough guy, Eddie Egan, mm -hmm. the character that Gene... Who's was. also in the film. He's in the film. But he was very vulnerable. But to survive and to make these busts and not get killed, he had to be a tough guy. And that meant push people around and use the N-word. Yeah. Um, all the time. Yeah. And Gene didn't want to do that. Yeah. The first day of shooting, I shot the interrogation of the young black kid mm -hmm. who these two cops pick up in a bar, chase. Uh, they sort of rough him up. Good cop, and, bad cop. It's probably one of the first times that you really yeah. saw that. Yeah. And they ask him questions that are unanswerable. Yeah. So he tends to answer the questions he knows he's more comfortable with. Yeah. Like, did you pass that nickel bag to that guy in there? Uh, or did you ever pick your feet in Poughkeepsie? Poughkeepsie? <laughs> you know, and... In or, we did 37 takes of that. Holy shit. Gene couldn't get to it. Yeah. And then I realized, and I used what I had learned in discussions with him, that he absolutely hated authority. Yeah. And he didn't like acting that much, although he became one of the greatest <laughs> uh, film actors ever. Unbelievable. Yeah. But we had a lot of problems on that that worked themselves out on the set because... Uh, we were on the same page in understanding each other. Well, did, does now if he were to tell the same story, would he say, "Well, well, what uh, Bill was doing was he was you know, putting me in a position to be angry at him," or would he have said, "Like you know, he was a pain in the ass to work with. He drove me nuts. I no. got pissed off at him." Here's what he has said, and yeah. you can look it up. It's on the Blu-ray uh -huh. of the French Connection. Uh -huh. On one edition of it, there's interviews with everybody, yeah. and Gene says, after the first day of shooting, I wanted to quit, Yeah, because I wasn't getting it. And Bill Friedkin didn't let me quit. Yeah. He held me in there, he kept me in there, I'm forever grateful to him. Now, do you watch that film occasionally? Only, uh, rarely, w like if I go to a screening of it, um... And I haven't seen it for a while, and I have to talk about it. And what's your what? What do you feel when you watch it? Does it take you anywhere? Do you? I think it's pretty well made. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> I can't say that about everything, but I've seen a few of my films, and I honestly think, where the hell did that come from? In a bad way or a good way? Good way. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I tend not to watch the films where I know I'm going to see bad stuff. And which ones are those? Oh. Uh, 
if I name them, I'll be putting down some actors. But I, all of my films are definitely not of the same quality. What do you think would have happened if you had Jackie Gleason as Popeye Doyle? I think he would have been great. Yeah. But at that time, the film was made by 20th Century Fox. Sure. And I suggested Gleason, and I called Gleason, got his phone number, told him the story. We didn't have a script, but I told him what it was, and he said, okay, kid, that sounds interesting. I went to the head of the studio, Dick Zanuck. He said, no way. We will never make another film with Jackie Gleason. Ugh. He had made a film, uh, a silent film, about a clown called Gigo. Yeah. G-I-G-O-T. It was a silent movie. Uh, yeah, right, right. But it it was the biggest disaster in the history of Fox at that time. <laughs> and um, so he was against Gleason. But Gleason was my idea of the character. A big, heavy set, what we used to call a black Irishman. Mm -hmm. You know, a dark, brooding Irish guy who loved to drink and break heads and, yeah. you know, and carried a great girth along with him. What compelled you to do Sorcerer, you know, from Wages of Fear? What was your relationship with that film, the original film? I thought it was great, but not many people had seen it. The Wages of Fear in this country, mm -hmm. in America, was was not widely seen at all. But I thought that it was a metaphor for the world situation. Four strangers riding a load of dynamite, and if they did, they hated each other, they were all flawed mm -hmm. but if they didn't cooperate they would blow up together mm -hmm. and that to me then and now seems a metaphor for the world situation you have all of these great powers all going in different directions and if they don't get on the same page everything's going to blow up right and that's the metaphor of sorcerer and the wages of fear did you see it at a uh, it for your own self. I mean, I don't know what the 70s were like, and I, I, I don't have a, a specific uh, sense of your reputation at that time, uh, but it seemed like a pretty crazy time, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the shifting of uh, of the, the business and, and the sort of weight that uh, you and that crew had of directors at that time. That that Did you find that that movie was a like a journey for yourself and confronting your own potential self-demise through your own uh, uh, ambition and creativity? I didn't think of it that way at the time. I thought of it as a story that I wanted to tell. Yeah. I did not want to do a remake of H.G. Clouseau's film. Yeah. I wanted to do all new characters, all new incidents, and all new events. Uh -huh. Just the central notion. In many ways, it's like doing another production of a great play, mm -hmm. like Hamlet. Sure. I mean, Laurence Olivier did Hamlet, you know, back in the 40s and 50s. And was it supposed to stop then? I mean, the first production of Hamlet, mm -hmm. I think in 1601, was done by an actor named Richard Burbage mm -hmm. and it, at the Globe Theater. And in fact, at the Globe Theater, the audience used to stand. They, they didn't sit down. Mm -hmm. They stood, they ate roast beef, they ate chicken yeah. stuff, and they talked to the stage. And when Richard Burbage played... The death scene in Hamlet, he was cheered, and the audience yelled out, Die again, Burbage, die again. He played the death scene three times. <laughs> now, there were no critics around right. to say this was great or Burbage was terrible. Nothing. There was just this play. And if there had not been the first folio of Shakespeare that came along some, I, I guess, 50 or 75 uh -huh. years later... yeah. You wouldn't have Hamlet, but every production of Hamlet is different. Yeah. And uh, Sorcerer is different, right. but inspired right. by the wages of fear. But could you, do you see, can you see yourself, like, where you sit now with your, you know, your, your life uh, experience, uh, all that you've done, mm -hmm. when you look back at that time shooting in those jungles, I mean, do you, do you know that guy still? Yeah, I, I, I'm not all that different. I would not take the same risks now because I put people's lives in danger on a number of the films I did. Did you know you were doing it? I didn't care. Mm. 
I didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. And the people that followed me did not think about it. I would not do that today. I would not film a chase like the French Connection today with no clearances, no permissions, no nothing. Just send a car for 26 blocks, 90 miles an hour through regular traffic. No, I wouldn't do that God, I don't think they would let you do that today. Well, they didn't want to let me do that then, but I had all these cops around me. Yeah. And uh, with their badges, they were off-duty cops, and they were with me when I shot the chase in case we got busted. So they were watching case. your back. Yeah. But uh, today, no one should do that today. There have been guys who have taken similar chances uh -huh. in recent years, and people got killed. Yeah. And it's only by the grace of God that nobody got hurt or killed on a film like The French Connection. And that was the farthest thing from my mind. I felt that I was bulletproof. And I felt that the people around me were not going to be hurt or injured. Um, you were conscious of that? Like there was a mania to it almost? I felt that what I did was the only possible way to do it. I couldn't get permission <laughs> to do something like that. <laughs> right. Who would give you permission? <laughs> yeah. You know, to go 90 miles an hour mm -hmm. for 26 blocks through traffic. The only thing we had was a gumball on top of the car yeah. that Hackman and the stuntman right. drove. So you couldn't see the gumball when we were inside the car, and we took it off when we were <laughs> shooting exteriors. Oh, my God. But you had, you know, a screaming siren as I was blowing through traffic. Yeah. That stuff is, is all real. Now, today, they do just as good, if not better, on a computer. Do you think that really? Yeah, I do, and the audience does, too. The audience doesn't mind that these effects are computer generated yeah, but, images but, but but i think that 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 there's been some new neural pathways created for that expectation like i think they that you can do a lot more with a computer but i think you innately know that it's not real and you watch the french connection and there's a, a there's a grittiness to it where you're like holy shit but it's you still know, not real mark it's a movie no wait, but you just told me people's lives were at stake yeah and that's not a good thing i get that but it's on film uh it is on <laughs> film and um I don't uh, boast about it. No, I think no, the I French know. Connection is a damn well-made film, and people's lives were in danger, including my own. Yeah. And I frankly didn't give a damn. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean I, de I devalued human lives. Right. I never thought about it. You were caught up in your process. We're going to do this. Yeah. This way. Did you fight for it? There was nobody to resist me. <laughs> See, that's the freedom I'm talking about. Yeah, we were there alone. Yeah. <laughs> this was, uh, you know, like being um, uh, castaways. Well, nope. what, well, let's talk a little bit about that. Like, you know, because I know, like, there's something comes into my mind. You know, Nicholson, or I think, was one time Nicholson was, uh, you know, talking. I think uh, it was one of the last times I think he went to the Golden Globes. I don't remember what it was, but he was talking, he was reflecting about when he started acting, when your generation of filmmakers started to mm -hmm. really, you know, take over Hollywood, that there was this crossover for a while there between, you know, your generation and old Hollywood. Like, everyone was sort of around. Mm -hmm. So you got to spend time you know with the with the filmmakers that you respected and admired and it, and it was all part of the same community now who were you able to sort of like when when you were coming up and you were starting to when you made french connection i made i imagine that gave you a lot of access to to yeah so who who did you seek out and what did you learn from the generation before you my closest friends mm -hmm. from the golden era yeah. of hollywood were billy wilder richard brooks bud yorkin who mm -hmm. was a great television director who yeah. created All in the Family. Right, with uh, Norman, right? With Norman Lear and a number of other people like that. But the names that come to mind uh, right away mm -hmm. are Wilder. And I used to have a hamburger with Billy three, four days a week yeah. at the old Johnny Rockets in oh, Beverly right. Hills. Sure. I'll tell you a, a funny anecdote oh, yeah. about okay. Billy being in Billy's apartment. Uh-huh. And Billy had Giacometti's and Brock's and Picasso's and uh, great mm -hmm. artworks. Mm -hmm. He also had on one of his walls a little framed uh, postcard-like uh, object. It was framed on the wall next to a Brock. And I looked at it, 
And I said, Billy, what, what the hell is this? And he said, this was one of the cards that they passed out it, when they had the first preview of the film Nanachka mm-hmm. with Greta Garbo that Billy wrote and Ernst Lubitsch directed. And the habit then was when Lubitsch, uh, w- when they'd stop, uh, finished looking at a preview, they were in a limousine going from Pasadena back home. Lubitsch would sit in the back of the car with Billy, and he'd flip through these cards that the audience used to fill out. Uh And he stopped at one card and burst into laughter. And Billy said, what is that? And Lubitsch handed it to him, and that's the card that's framed on his wall. Uh And this is for the film Nanachka, which is really a work of art. Uh The card says, this is the funniest film I ever seen. This film is so funny, I peed in my girlfriend's hand. <laughs> and he framed that. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, when I was a kid and I went to previews in Chicago, yeah. I used to fill out all kinds of crazy... Right. Sh- I'd say, you know, I'd say, what did you think of this film? This film stunk. It yeah. was terrible. Yeah. You know, just a rat fuck the, yeah. um, you know, the, the guys who made it. Yeah, yeah. But... I guess that card was sincere. It was so funny, he peed in his girlfriend's hand. He did, and Billy Wilder loved that. Oh, yeah. But Billy was great. Richard Brooks, very interesting, deep, intelligent guy, uh, made Looking for Mr. Goodbar mm-hmm. and uh, uh, In Cold Blood. Right. A lot of great films. Did I you... knew John Huston. Oh, how was who that? Who had made one of my all-time favorites, which I still watch. Which I may one? go home and watch it today again. Which one? The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Yeah. Which is boss. Crazy, right, that movie? Nothing like it today. I, uh, it's see, great. See, great. there you go. Nothing like it today. In my view. But, you know, there are people listening to this podcast sure. who can't wait to see the next spandex movie. Mm-hmm. You know, where guys wear spandex and sure. fly around and save the world. You know? (laughs) Okay. That's what the theater is today. The best um, platform for films today is the digital platform. Mm -hmm. Places like Netflix Mm -hmm. and FX and HBO. You know, not the theaters for well, me. Well, let's let's go back. So you're in Chicago, and you see you you see Orson Welles' uh, Citizen Kane. Or when did you see that? What were you do- what did you do when you were a kid? You got brothers and sisters. No, I was an only child. We lived in a one room apartment in yeah. Chicago, no larger than this garage, uh-huh. which I guess is about uh, fifteen feet by. Yeah. 10 feet, yeah. something like that. The three of you. And that was my mother and father and me. We had a little burner, uh-huh. not a kitchen, uh-huh. one bathroom. Wow. They had a bed that came out of the wall, and I had a cot. Right. And I never knew we were poor because everyone else around me lived the same way. And my dad never made more than $50 a week. What'd he do? He did a number of things, yeah. uh, and he wound up uh, uh, in a men's clothing store that was owned by his brothers. Oh yeah, and he worked there. And and did they were were they from uh, another place, or they all grew up here in the states? Were they immigrants? All of my parents' uh, origins were in Kiev, Russia, the Ukraine, mm-hmm. and they came over when they were very young. My mother had twelve brothers and sisters. Wow. My father had eleven. And as you can imagine, I was an only child. Mm-hmm. Be very tough to have uh-huh. other children in a space like this, Mark. Yeah, <laughs> you know, with a child in the room. Well, you think that was why they didn't have more? Undoubtedly. Yeah. I, I mean, I was unaware of mm-hmm. anything to do with their sex life. Did <laughs> and you would know. <laughs> I, mean, you I would right have there. to know. I mean, <laughs> you know, I crashed there, and so did they. Yeah. Did you have a relationship with that huge extended family? Oh, sure. We were very close. A lot of my relatives did well, mm-hmm. very well to do. One was a very famous cop in oh, Chicago yeah? named Harry Lang. Harry Lang and um, his partner were the two guys who brought in Frank Nitty. The uh, gangster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they shot Nitty eight times in the stomach. And then my uncle put a bullet through his own left arm and claimed that Nitty shot at him first. 
<laughs> but Nitty didn't keep a gun in his office. My uncle's partner's name was Harry Miller. Uh-huh. And Miller and Lang were the guys who brought in Nitty. Nitty lived. No kidding. Print with eight bullets in his huh. gut. And uh, for a variety of reasons, my uncle had to leave the Chicago police force. Yeah. And he opened a, a tavern in uh-huh. Chicago. And as a kid, I used to work there. Oh, and yeah. I met all these characters wow. from both sides of the law. Right. And did that, did, was that fascinating to you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I can't. Oh, yeah. They were on another planet. Yeah. yeah. You know. Oh, yeah. And uh, these guys were cops, but it was the first inkling I had that the best cops were guys who could think like the bad guys. Right. It's, they were bad guys themselves. That's right. Well, that's what you get with Popeye Doyle in a way. There's yeah. a moral, there's a sort of like a moral ambiguity about how to do the job. Well, the precincts where they worked, mm-hmm. the 81st precinct in Bedford-Stuyvesant, the 28th precinct in Harlem, these places were known as murder factories yeah you know Mm -hmm. and in order to survive they just broke every law that was there yeah and i realized that as a cop you know what drove you in the street was um your instinct and the fear of getting killed yourself sure and um, so they had to assume an attitude mm-hmm. that persisted for many years in police departments across the country. And it's based on adrenaline. Yeah. I have been, I was out with the French Connection cops when, and doing the scenes like in that all African American bar. Right. Where they rousted the joint and found all the vials of. Under the counter. Under the yeah. counter and stuff. And. That scene I saw played 30 or 40 times. And when I went and saw it, Eddie Egan gave me a 38, a policeman's special. And he said, cover the back door. And I used to pray to God that nobody would try to go out the back. Because I didn't. was in real life, emotionally <laughs> unable to pull the trigger. Sure. Okay? We weren't supposed to. But, <laughs> but I, I had, and I watched them do that and get away with it, and I know that they were driven, as are most cops today, by adrenaline. Uh-huh. You're a young cop. You got a family at home, a couple of kids, a wife. You get up in the morning, strap on a gun and a badge and go into the street, and you don't know if you're coming back. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some cops, as there are people in every walk of life Mm -hmm. that may have racial prejudice. Sure. But the cops I met did not. And many of the cops I met and rode with all across this country and in Europe, some of them black, uh, had the same adrenaline drive. Sure. Well, it sounds to me that during that time, you know, certainly with the French Connection, you seem to be driven by some of that same adrenaline. Mm-hmm. Now, after, yeah. after that movie, so you, okay, real quick, though, in Chicago, what got you into show business? Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I graduated high school. Yeah. I went to high school, never paid attention to anything, didn't want to spend another day in a classroom, right. so I didn't go to college. Yeah. The Saturday I graduated, I looked in the Chicago newspapers in the want ad section, mm-hmm. and there was a a job available for young people who wanted to work in the mailroom of a television station. Yeah. And uh, I went to the wrong place. Yeah. There were two stations, and they were across the street from each other. There was WBBM, which was a CBS affiliate, in uh-huh. the Wrigley Building. Yep. And in the Tribune Tower, there was WGN, which was known as the world's greatest newspaper. Uh-huh. But they owned uh, WGN Radio and Television, Channel uh-huh. 9 in Chicago. I went there on a Saturday to apply for a job in the mailroom. And the guy in the mailroom was an interesting guy. His name was Ray Domalski. Yeah. And uh, he uh, was there on Saturday, and he asked me about myself. I answered a few questions. I had had a lot of after-school jobs before that. Sure. And he, uh, at the end, he said, okay, kid. He said, you can start Monday. But he said, tell me something. Are you stupid? 
And I said, I'm sorry? And he said, are you stupid? I said, I don't know, possibly. He said, because look at that piece of paper where you have the ad for an opening yeah. in the mailroom. He said, what does it say? It, I said, it said 440... For North Michigan Avenue. Yeah. He said, that's WBBM across the street. This is 441 yeah. North Michigan. We didn't place that ad. Uh -huh. You came to the wrong place. But you seem like a nice kid, so I'm going to hire you. <laughs> and that's how most people came up in the business then. Yeah. There were no film schools. There were no television schools. Television was new. You took an entry level job in the mailroom or as an usher, and you worked your way up. What year's that? Uh, in my case, it was about 1956. Yeah. So, so television is pretty new. Oh, it was very new. It was a miracle in people's home. You yeah. have no idea. Yeah. None of your listeners. Yeah. Have any idea what it's like to see an image in your house? We used to wake up at like six in the morning just to see the profile of a of a buffalo indian yeah. which was the only thing showing on a tv screen and you used to tune your screen to that image yeah. of a it was a drawing of a buffalo indian like what used to be on the nickel right and you would focus on that yeah. and but we would just sit there and look at this. We couldn't believe there was an image. It didn't move. Right. It didn't do anything. <laughs> right. But there was an image in our home. It was a miracle. Yeah. It was magic. Yeah. I guess like the ancients, when something happened that was out of the ordinary, thought yeah. it was a miracle. Yeah, sure. Uh, to me, television was a, was a miracle. And you remember radio. Radio. It was no inch television. Right. But I remember dramatic radio, yeah. and that's the thing that influenced me most as yeah. a filmmaker. Really? Dramatic radio. The storytelling. Yes, and with sound. Yeah. The use of sound effects and music and the human voice uh -huh. to tell a story. And a lot of those things creeped me out. Oh, yeah. There were amazing radio dramas mm -hmm. then on shows called Suspense mm -hmm. and Inner Sanctum and... Uh, uh, Orson Welles played War of the, the, World? Sh the Shadow. Oh, yeah. I, I was too young for, for the War oh, of the yeah. Worlds broadcast. I heard it much later. Yeah. And uh, I, I think it's probably exaggerated on the effect that it had. Sure. Because that show had a very small audience uh -huh. compared to Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. Yeah. Who was a... Edgar Bergen was a ventriloquist, right. which was weird. Right, Mortimer Snurd too, right? Mortimer Snurd yeah. and Charlie McCartney yeah. did the voices. Yeah. But when you saw him on television, he was a terrible ventriloquist. His <laughs> lips were moving in, while Charlie's were. I guess that's what, that's the one downside of television. You saw that Edgar Bergen stunk. As a ventriloquist, yeah. but the characters and the dialogue were great. So television was like mind-blowing. Oh, yeah. It was a miracle in everyone's home. And we could afford a television set, uh -huh. which was about as big as this computer you have in front of you. What shows do you remember? Studio One uh -huh. and Playhouse 90. Right. These were the shows that grabbed me. Playhouse 90 was done live in several sound stages in what is was then called Television City mm -hmm. at CBS yeah. on Fairfax. Still there. Yeah. And they did all these live shows with live cameras everywhere. And they were some of the greatest things I've ever seen. They were directed by people like John Frankenheimer, Sidney Lumet, Franklin Schaffner, the guys who became the great film directors of the 70s. Yeah. The generation that had just preceded mine. So you, when did you start directing? Uh, but I was about 18 years old. So directing local television? Mm-hmm. In the studio? What we yeah, it was all stupid. Well, I occasionally did remotes, like uh -huh. an auto show where uh -huh. I had five cameras, and you'd have a live camera, you know, and there would be uh, livestock or something uh, walking around at the International Amphitheater while there was an auto show, and uh, a cow would walk in front of the camera, take a dump, <laughs> no way to cut around it, you know, there it is, uh, the glories of live yeah. TV. But um, most of the stuff I did was in the studio. I did uh, every every kind of show, cooking shows, news programs, interview shows. 
I uh, was the floor manager on a show called They Stand Accused, which was a live courtroom drama that came on just before the Jackie Gleason show on the old Dumont Network, Mm -hmm. which is now gone. It's interesting that the things you're saying are still on TV. The, the, sta- the, the archetypes and the standards were set. Cooking shows, live court shows, you know, remotes from places. I mean, they're still staples. They are. They're still on. But then they were pretty much the only thing that was on. So, you know, now you have hundreds of things to choose from. So when did you start There were doing- only three networks then. I know. It's a small And a bunch more. of local stations. Yeah. Do you miss that time? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what got me started, though. Yeah. So what, well, how did you make it out here? I mean, when did you come? What What compelled you towards uh, the, the, the films? In that period, I think it was around 1956. Yeah. Somebody told me that there was a great film playing at an art house on the near north side called the Surf Theater. Mm-hmm. And the film was called Citizen Kane. Yeah. I knew nothing about it. Before Citizen Kane, I just used to go to films as a kid on Saturday afternoon and see the Three Stooges and a cartoon and a newsreel and a couple of funky shorts and Mm -hmm. stuff. And, you know, it was a place for kids to go for a quarter on a Saturday afternoon. Somebody said, you should see this film called Citizen Kane, which... uh, it was origi- originally came out in 1941. Mm-hmm. This was 15 years later. I went to see this film, and I was captivated. I stayed in the theater all day. I went to the first show, which was a noon show, and I watched it until the 10 o'clock show and left at midnight. Yeah. And I came out of there thinking, I don't know what in the hell this is, but whatever it is, that's what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And but I was in live television. Yeah. And then a strange thing happened. I hate going to parties. Yeah. Still to yeah. this day. I like to see and talk to people in small groups or one on one. Yeah. But I don't like gigantic parties. There was a woman in Chicago, very wealthy social woman who loved and supported the arts. And she did a few, produced a few programs at the TV station where I worked. Yeah. And she used to try and get me to come to her parties on Friday night. And you're like 25 now or what? Less. Yeah. And this, she lived uh, in what was known as the Gold Coast area of Chicago, yeah. near North Side. She yeah. lived in a mansion. Mm-hmm. And on a Friday night, she had people from all walks of life. Lenny Bruce used to go there. And Oscar Brown Jr. and uh, Alderman from Chicago, uh, Dr. Bergen Evans of Northwestern University's uh, English department. So she was putting together like these dinner salons almost, where you engage in conversation. A hundred people, yeah. oh, big salons, yeah. Yeah. massive, yeah. with food and drink. Right. And one day I found myself squeezed against a corner. I went there, yeah. finally. Yeah. And there were a hundred odd people around. And I'm standing next to a priest, a guy in a priest collar. Yeah. And I'm holding a drink, and he's holding a drink. And I didn't know what to say to him, but yeah. I just I just blurted out, Father, um, wh- where is your church? And he said, oh, I don't have a church. He said, um, I'm the Protestant chaplain at the Cook County Jail on death row. And uh, I said, oh. Uh, and I instinctively, I said... Have you ever met anybody on death row that you thought was innocent? And he said, yeah, there's a guy now, a black guy who's uh, 32 years old. He's been in for nine years. He's up for first degree murder. And both the warden and I think that he was beaten to confess by the Chicago cops. And I, it just went right through me. And I thought about this conversation. His name was Father Robert Surfling. Mm-hmm. And I thought about this conversation all weekend, and I called him at the Cook County Jail on a Monday morning. I said, Father, you remember me? He said, yeah, we talked at Lois Solomon's. Yeah. I said, could I meet this guy whose name was Paul Crump, mm-hmm. C-R-U-M-P? Mm-hmm. He said, well, why would you want to meet him? I said, I, I don't know, but I said, I work in television, and I might be able to do him some good. He said, you can't do him any good. 
his all of his appeals have been denied. He was denied twice by the United States Supreme Court. He was denied certiorari, which meant that the court would take his case. The court denied hearing his case twice by one vote, five to four against. He's finished. The only thing that could save him is a pardon from the governor, who was then Otto Kerner, Democratic governor. Yeah. And I thought, I said, well, look, I don't know, maybe I could get his story in front of the public and something could happen. And he said, let me ask the warden. Now, the warden was a guy named Jack Johnson, yeah. a big, heavy-set bull of a guy who had executed three people in the electric chair and did not want to execute anyone else. And he liked Paul Crump, and he felt that Crump had become rehabilitated in prison, and he may not have been guilty in the first place. So he let me come down and meet him, meet Crump, and I went to the television station where I worked. I totally believed in Crump's story, as did many others. And I went to the TV station, and the general manager said, we don't make documentaries. We do live television. We don't want to do a documentary film. And so I went across town to the ABC station, which was Channel 7 in Chicago, run by a man called Red Quinlan, mm -hmm. who had wanted to hire me, but I stayed at WGN because I was doing the Chicago Symphony Orchestra program live, and that was a great experience uh, at WGN. So I stayed there, but Quinlan financed a 16-millimeter documentary that I made with another guy who was a live TV cameraman yeah. named Bill Butler, uh -huh. who later was the cameraman, the director of photography on Jaws, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, a uh -huh. number of other great films. But he and I started together, and we learned by rote how to make a film. We had access to Death Row, and I I knew nothing about how to make a documentary. I had never seen one, yeah. but I was motivated to make this film as a kind of court of last resort for this guy. Yeah. We made this film. It w it's very primitive, whatever, but it was shown to the governor of Illinois, Otto Kerner, uh -huh. and he sent me a note. And the note said, I've seen your documentary and though my parole and pardon board has voted two to one to send Mr. Crump to the electric chair, I'm going to pardon him wow. to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. And that was uh, a first. I mean, it had happened once before that I'm aware of in Chicago, the Loeb-Leopold case, right. where Clarence Darrow defended Loeb and Leopold, and they got life imprisonment instead of the chair. They were kids teenagers yeah. anyway the film saved this man's life and red quinlan then entered it in a whole bunch of film festivals where it won uh the best not only best documentary but best film it won the golden gate award at the san francisco film festival in 1960 uh, Has that thing been re-released? It's been re-released. It's out there. You can, What's it called? The People versus Paul Crump. But it saved this gentleman's life, and I thought, my God, the power of film. Right. What you can do with film? Yeah. And then I had offers to come out to Hollywood to yeah. do documentaries. And I came out to California in 1965 after I had moved to ABC in Chicago, and Bill Butler and I had our own documentary unit. So you were we, doing docs? I started, after having done over a thousand live shows, mm -hmm. I went into documentary film and did three or four in Chicago for ABC. And then uh, David Walper brought me to L.A., where I did documentaries for Walper and the ABC Network. Mm -hmm. And how did the how did the opportunity for the first uh, narrative film come? The first narrative film, I, the first thing I ever did on a soundstage was the Alfred Hitchcock Hour. Mm. The producer of the Hitchcock Hour, who is Norman Lloyd, 
at that time. Yeah. It had been on for 10 years. Norman Lloyd was a great actor. He's still alive. He's 101 years old. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the uh, guy who played the saboteur in Hitchcock's film Saboteur. Uh-huh. And he worked with the Mercury Theater and Orson right. Welles. Right. He's still around. God bless him. I think I think Judd Apatow just used him in uh, Trainwreck, didn't he? he I don't went... know, but he he could have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, there's Norman, and he was the producer, and he saw the William Morris office started to represent me. Yeah. And they showed my documentary around Hollywood. Yeah. As like a calling card. Yeah. And Norman Lloyd saw it and he said that there was more suspense in the first five minutes of that film than anything they had done that year on the Hitchcock Hour. And I went to meet with him and he gave me a script that was written by James Bridges, who later became a fine screenwriter, uh-huh. Urban Cowboy, and yeah. a number of other. I, I think he wrote uh, The China Syndrome. Oh, right, yeah. And uh, But he had written the script for The Hitchcock Hour, and it was starring John Gavin, who was in Psycho. Yeah. Norman said, look, I have to let John Gavin see your film, and he has approval of who's going to direct it. And if he had said no, I, I probably wouldn't have a career. Yeah. But John saw the film and said, okay, I don't imagine this guy's any worse than some of the other guys you got directing these shows. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so he approved me. And then how does he, and then the first big movie was, was The French Connection? No, the next, the first feature I made was with Sonny and Cher. <laughs> yeah. Sonny Bono wanted to work with a young guy on their first feature film, uh-huh. and they showed him some of my documentaries and yeah. then the Hitchcock Hour. And yeah. Sonny and I met. We became great friends, and we wrote the script together. We ad-libbed a movie uh-huh. called Good Times, Yeah, and uh, it was just a joy to work with them. Yeah, And the film did well. It was made for nothing, and the producer sold it to Columbia for, I think, $5 million, which was not chump change in those days. Sure. And they were a big act at that time? They were big. They had all kinds of number yeah. one songs. Right, right. Uh, I Got You, Babe. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, the Beat Goes On. Yeah. Better Sit Down, Kids. Uh-huh. Sonny was one of the few geniuses I've ever met. Yeah? He didn't. He couldn't read a note of music. All the music was in his head. Started with Phil Spector, I think. He was a gopher for Phil Spector. Yeah. And did you guys remain friends throughout his life? Till he died in mm. a ski accident. Terrible. In Aspen. Yeah. And I occasionally still see Cher. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, and I've gone to a lot of her shows in Vegas. But you know, I don't know where she lives now. We're sure. In different worlds. But we were close for many years after. So through the Sonny and Cher and through the stuff you were doing, you were offered the French Connection? No. Uh, The next thing I did was a film of Harold Pinter's play, The Birthday Party, which I saw when I was much younger in San Francisco, and it mesmerized me, as did Citizen Kane, the movie. Pinter's play, The Birthday Party, was just an incredible, was and is an incredible piece of work. It's heavy, Uh, right? Well... Yeah, it's called a comedy of menace, mm-hmm. but there's more menace than comedy. Mm-hmm. And it, was that your first experience with really you know, taking a piece of theater and trying to imagine yeah. it as film? Well, I was, as I say, uh, really moved by it. And they came to me, a company called Palomar Pictures, uh, which was owned by the ABC television network. They said, what would you like to do? And I said, um, the birthday party. I called Harold Pinter. I got Uh his phone number in England. We spoke, and he didn't know who the hell I was. Uh, But I guess something I said intrigued him. Right. And I went to England to meet with him, and we met for two or three days at his house. And he said, okay, um, let's do it. And um, he wrote the screenplay, and I spent a year with Pinter where I learned pretty much everything I know about drama. Uh-huh. He was incredible. As you know, he's won the Nobel Prize for literature yeah. toward the end of his life. And he was hes probably the most fascinating man I've ever met. And I learned so much from him. 
What what are some of the 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 things that you carry with you uh, that aren't haven't just become second nature about drama that that stand out in your head from him? Well, uh, in Pinter's style, which is not a style that I totally adopted, mm-hmm. every single word, every comma, every period had meaning. There were no throwaway. There was no throwaway mm-hmm. dialogue. Mm-hmm. Every oh, right. he single wrote pauses word, in, right? He, he, he wrote in the pauses, yeah. and a long pause was different from a short pause, mm-hmm. and he made it a practice never to explain the meanings of his work. If you didn't get it, the hell with you. Yeah, he got it, mm-hmm. and he um, he wrote stuff that was completely off the radar in the late 50s and early 60s. Mm-hmm. Birthday Party, I think, had been written in 1958. Betrayal? Did he write He betray- wrote Betrayal, yeah. which is a story told backwards, a yeah. play, yeah. where the last scene of the play appears first right. and works at bay, its way back to when this couple first met. And um, so he experimented with form, but he taught me that every word does count. He would seldom use useless adjectives like the word very. Yeah. What does the word very mean? If I say to you, I like you very much, does that give any indication of how much I like you? No. Yeah. Very much. What is very? <laughs> this, is, this water is very good or not very yeah. good or whatever right. you might say. There are certain words that carry no meaning. Like interesting. Interesting is the worst thing you could say about somebody's movie <laughs> or podcast. If somebody says this podcast is interesting, it's an abject failure. <laughs> you know, it's the worst thing you could say because all of the arts are created for a purpose, which is to draw out an emotional response mm-hmm. from the listener or the viewer. That's all. Yeah. Not to be interesting. Yeah. Who in the hell wants interesting? <laughs> yeah. But Pinter's work was gripping and involving. And there was not a wasted sentence, a wasted word, or a wasted comma. And that impressed me very much to this day. Yeah. And in writing my autobiography. Sure. I actually made a pass on my autobiography where I took out every time I used the word very. Uh-huh. As a meaningless word. Did you leave them out? Took them out. Mm-hmm. I, I, I did one pass of the book, uh, which is a pretty thick book, and took out the word very. But Pinter also, uh, he, when he came to the rehearsals mm-hmm. of the birthday party, and the actors would say, Harold, what does this mean, or what does that mean? He would say, I have no idea what it means or why it's there. You have to figure that out for yourself. Now, there are many actors that work today from, like, backstory. Mm -hmm. Harold provided no backstory. Like, how how were these two people who are in conflict with one another? How were they when they were children? How did this guy feel about his parents? He doesn't care about any of that crap. I'll give you an example of how I've used that yeah. in a film. I made a film called The Hunted yeah. with uh, Tommy Lee Jones and Benicio Del Toro. And this is how Tommy Lee Jones works. If he's cast right, you never talk to him about meaning or backstory or even what's going in front of the camera. You'll just sit with him. He knows uh, all of that. That's why he's agreed to take the role. Right. So all you do is, all I do is I say, Tommy, you come in that door, you walk over here, you sit down, you talk to this guy over here, then you get up, you look out the window over there, then you come back, sit down, you take a drink of water, say something to him, then you leave. Yeah. I just give him the action. He says, let me see if I got this right. I come in that door over there, I sit down over there, I talk to this guy over here, I get up and look out the window, come back, sit down, say a line to him, take a sip of water, get up and leave. I say, that's right. He's okay, I'm ready. And he shoot it, one take, done. Yeah. With Benicio Del Toro, yeah. in the same scene, yeah. in the same movie, you come in that do- Why do I come in the door? <laughs> what if you discovered me lying on the floor? Well, um... <laughs> 
how did I feel about my father when I was 14 years old? Uh -huh. And I would say to Benicio and other actors like that, that, of that ilk who ha need a backstory and really from which to work, I would say, look, I don't know. If it isn't on the page, it's not on the stage. <laughs> and I could make up some bullshit. Right. I could make up a story about how you felt about your father when you were 14. Yeah. But I don't really know. Yeah. So I could lie to you, and if it helps you, I will make up such a story. <laughs> and eventually we'd come around to him doing the staging that I asked him to do. Right. Or suggesting a better staging. Because... When you're a director, uh -huh. you must consider that there are many ways to do a scene, infinite number of ways to do, just to shoot the two of us in this room. Sure. And the best idea works. Yeah. Wherever you get the best idea of how to do the scene or where to put the camera, high, low, straight on, from the floor, uh -huh. from the ceiling, uh -huh. from behind a monitor, whatever, to pan around the room and see what's here. The best idea usually comes to the fore, and it could come from the prop man or a stagehand, which is I don't pay, why I don't pay a lot of attention to the auteur theory, mm -hmm. because they're me film is a collaborative medium. Right. You Always. work alone yeah. with one person, I imagine, Sometimes you've had no, two. I, I've done TV, and, you know, it's but collaboration is necessary. Well, uh, only in, like, the performing arts. Yeah. I mean, like, if you're a painter, sure. all you need is a blank canvas, right. some paint, and a brush. Right. And your imagination. Photographer, yeah. the same. Yeah. If you're a writer, yeah. you just need a, a pencil, right. a typewriter, or a computer. Sure. Uh, and you work alone yeah. from your imagination. A composer yeah. works the same way. Right. But in any of the performing arts, you work with many people. It's a Orson Welles once called the equipment that is used in the making of a film a one-ton pencil. Mm. It's actually <laughs> about a 20-ton pencil. <laughs> yeah. So you, basically you're saying that, that in the big picture, Tommy Lee's a little easier to work with. <laughs> it's different because... Yeah. These backstories, yeah. which Pinter never right. dealt with, yeah. he would he would ridicule them. Uh -huh. uh, but these backstories are are meaningless. I mean, an actor to produce an emotion ordinarily does work from something called sense memory. Yeah, but it's he, their business. You remember what frightened you right, or right. made you happy or made you fall in love when you were much younger, mm -hmm. and you utilize that sure. experience to produce an emotion as another character. Let's get to the exorcist. So you win, you win best picture, you win best director, you have French connection, you know, it, it sort of, you're, you're a made guy. We didn't really talk about how the French connection happened. How'd that happen? Exactly? Everything happens by luck or accident, and everyone turned it down. Every studio turned it down for two years. Really? And I actually was on the unemployment line. I hadn't made, done anything for two years. I had just finished The Boys in the Band two years before, uh, but I wasn't working. And finally, one day, Dick Zanuck called and said, look, I don't know what the hell this thing is you guys are trying to do i'm sort of intrigued by it if you can make it for a million and a half dollars go ahead you better make it soon because i'm going to be fired out of here in six months and he was and, but he greenlit the film we had a budget of three million dollars but we anticipated having a star like paul newman right who was getting the top salary then which was five hundred thousand dollars a picture yeah today it's chump change yeah of course for a movie star yeah but it wasn't then and dick zanuck said you don't need a movie star just get the right actor in this thing yeah and i remember saying to him would you go with a non-actor who was right he said well like who who are you talking about and i said you ever hear of a journalist in new york called jimmy breslin he said, yeah, yeah, I love Breslin's writing style. He wrote a lot like Damon Runyon. Yeah. I said, I know Jimmy Breslin. He's a good friend of mine. Let me go back and audition him and see how he did. I had hired Scheider. Yeah. And I hire people based on instinct. Yeah. I don't read them. Right. 
if I thought you were right for a part, I wouldn't ask you to read right. it and audition. Yeah. Uh, and this, with Roy Scheider, he walked into my, my casting director, yeah. who was not a casting director. He was a film and theater critic for The Village Voice in New York. He knew every actor in the country. And he discovered Whoopi Goldberg and a lot of people. And one day he brought Roy Scheider into my office. And Roy sat down opposite me as I'm sitting opposite you. Yeah. And uh, I said, how are you doing, Roy? He said, oh, great. I said, what are you doing now? He had never shot a film. Yeah. He said, I'm in an off-Broadway play by Jean Genet. And I said, well, what kind of part do you play? I knew instantly he was the guy. Yeah. And uh, he said, I play a cigar-smoking nun. I said, oh, yeah? He said, yeah. I said, okay, you got the part. <laughs> He said, what? what do, you, do you want me to read something? I Read something? There's nothing to read. Yeah. These guys just run after guys. They chase guys. They get your hands up. Yeah. You know, stop. Hey, you. You ever pick your feet in Poughkeepsie? Yeah. There's nothing to read. Yeah. You are right for this part. And I hired him. Mm -hmm. And then I had him rehearse with Jimmy Breslin. And the first day of rehearsal, Breslin uh, was great. It was all improvisation. Mm -hmm. He was wonderful. And he improvised scenes with Scheider. Yeah. And I had the young African-American actor, Alan Weeks. And we would improvise scenes outdoors. And the second day, Breslin would forget what he did the first day. On the third day, he showed up drunk. The fourth day, which was a Thursday, didn't show up at all. Right. And on Friday, I knew I had to fire him because yeah. it wasn't going to work. He came in very contrite, but he said to me, um, I, I didn't, he was a good friend, so I didn't know quite how to fire him, but he said to me, I'm sorry I was drunk and all this, and he said, um, isn't there a car chase in this movie? I said, yeah. He said, well, I got to tell you. He said, I promised my mother on her deathbed I would never drive a car, so I don't know how to drive. I said, you're fired. <laughs> And that's how he got out. Uh -huh. Hackman was not even on our radar. And where'd he come from? Well, he was suggested by his agent. Yeah. We met with him, the producer and I. I wasn't convinced. He had never done a leading role yeah. either, but he was a good supporting actor. He had been in Bonnie, Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde, yeah, yeah. Played Warren Beatty's brother. Yep. Good in a number of things as a supporting actor, but I didn't see him yeah. as his dark Irishman. Yeah. And, uh, but he was the last man standing. The last guy, and Zanuck was going to get fired, and so we had to go. And it worked out. By the grace of God. <laughs> you know, not my genius. Yeah. Believe me. And you were capturing it, like, immediately with that documentary style, so yeah. you got all that life. No second takes. Yeah. There are no second takes in life, Mark. Is that true? Try it sometime. <laughs> Try to do a retake on when you were 15 years old. I, you know, I feel okay. I don't think there's too many things I need to retake you. I would if I could, but I can't. So yeah. what the hell? What would you change? Or as you say, what the fuck? Yeah. Right? Yeah. No. What can you do? No. Change? No. But, you know, the Robert Frost poem about the road not taken. Yeah. you walking in a forest and there's... A path that breaks left and yeah. another that breaks right. And the decision you make right there to take that path is what leads you to the rest of your life. Hmm. And why did you make that decision then? Who in the hell knows? You know the great story, The Lady and the Tiger? Mm -mm. You do? No. Oh, was, when I was a kid, I read it. You know, yeah. about some guy in ancient Rome who uh, falls in love with the daughter of uh, one of the... Caesar's one of the yeah. kings and the he, the king says okay I'm going to put you into the arena where the Christians are thrown with the lions and there'll be two doors out of one door will come a man-eating lion yeah. if you choose that door and out of the other door will come my daughter and if you choose the right door you'll have my daughter and if you choose the wrong door your memory. Yeah. And the story never reveals what door this guy took. 
it, that captured my imagination, although I read almost nothing yeah. when I was in high school. Yeah. But that story captured my imagination. Every door we take yeah. is the lady or the tiger. Yeah, sometimes both. I guess so. I had to think about that. I, I, I hate blank air, but, you know, sometimes you, you hit me with something I have to think about. Sometimes both. Yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but who the hell knows? I'm yeah. sure that, you know, when you started and wanted to be a stand-up yeah. comic... There probably wasn't such a thing as a podcast. No, there was not. Yeah, you, you know, sometimes desperation yields the most amazing things. When you're up against the wall and you got nothing but a tunnel of darkness looking at you, you know, it, you can't give you up. Take a do- you open a door. Yeah, you got to open a door. You can't go back. There was a time when if somebody said to you, I'd like you to do a podcast, no, you'd say, what the hell is that? Yeah, exactly. Pod? What pod? Or even talking to people. You know, I, didn't, right. I never saw myself talking to people. So you go from the French Connection to the Exorcist, and that must have been... Here's how that happened. But, I mean, you have this weird fascination. It's not weird, but this, uh, you know, about menace, about thrillers, about... It seems like from when you were a kid listening to radio, that the the Mm -hmm. haunted nature and the the, the sort of uh, supernatural and the magic. Oh, fascinated me, as it does pretty much everybody. Sure. And, you know, it's... My philosophy is basically... Like what Hamlet said to his friend Horatio, yeah. there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. And that's what I believe. The things I don't know or understand. I can't deny uh, uh, the uh, power of religious belief. It's just there. Do you believe? You know, Do you believe? Well, I believe in the teachings of Jesus, as I've said to you. Mm-hmm. There are a number of things that uh, don't filter through my consciousness easily, but the mystery of faith is something that you have to pay attention to. For example, you take Jesus, mm. a guy walking in the desert and in in the diaspora yeah. over 2,000 years ago with a robe and sandals, no television, no internet, no podcasts, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. nothing written. He might be back, though. I could get him on here. I hear. I could. He might come <laughs> uh, because, you know, you've got a very intelligent audience. But here's a guy that spoke under the radar. Uh-huh. He spoke in synagogues. Yeah. He didn't come to start a new religion. Yeah. In fact, he's written about in two histories of first century Jerusalem, one by Philo, another by a guy called Flavius Josephus, Mm -hmm. who was a Jewish historian of first century uh, Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And all he wrote about Jesus was there was this man called Jesus Christ. He went among the people. He was he healed the sick and he was beloved of the people. That's all it says. Now, you read the Gospels, which were written, you know, a a couple of hundred years later, the first one. There's nothing in his own handwriting. Right. Nothing that he published. Yeah. No recordings of his voice. Yeah. Uh, To our knowledge, there was only one remaining thing that showed him in a drawing, which is called the Mandillion of Edessa. Uh. So people who weren't in his immediate presence didn't know him, he, read him, see him. There were thousands of people crucified by the Romans. Many of them were called Jesus. This particular guy is still worshipped by billions of people who have no way of seeing him literally, hearing him literally, other than through the mystery of faith. So, And I respect that. Uh-huh. Sometimes I don't respect something like that. When you get a guy like Adolf Hitler, sure. who also preached to the masses, but we did see him. People did see and hear him and saw his recordings and his newsreels and everything else, and they followed him. And his stage production, Tre- you know, tremendous stage production. Uh, well, yeah. The guys who produced Hitler yeah. were friggin' geniuses. Yeah. But to me... The two most interesting figures in recorded history are Hitler and Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's good and evil, opposite ends of the pole. And I don't understand the origins of either one. 
I don't know if I was around at the time of Christ, whether I would have been a follower or a believer or not, but I can't reject the teachings of Jesus. Right. Not in so far as they're presented by the church, as right. I've said. No, but just the poetry and the story and the the wisdom. The ideas and yeah. the wisdom mm-hmm. and a, a, a way to live mm-hmm. and how to treat your fellow human beings. and But you must possess a dark side as well. Of course I do. It's Everyone does. Yeah. Every human being, sure. you yeah. and every listener, we have within us both good and evil. And life is a constant struggle for each of us to suppress our worst angels. Uh-huh. And to to try not to do harm, and often we lose that battle. Yeah, we, we don't succeed. Yeah, fortunately, so, fortunately, you have a few rounds. You, you hope that you know at least a struggle. Yeah. Like there are different times where the where the uh, the darker angels uh, are running. Things. I think I believe that there is a good and bad side to every human being. Of course, and uh, and and so you know the exorcist is about that. But if you want, I'll tell you how I got to do that, or not. We no, can talk I, I about love something the, else. I well, hate to direct the well, no, no, no. But dialogue, I, the thing but, that I find amazing about it is though that you know even with you know the evolution of special effects, the theatrics of the exorcist and the pacing of the exorcist and the story, and it's still riveting. It's and a he, powerful story, and but like I don't mind the, the the effects; they work for me still. Still horribly creepy, and I think that you know when her head spun around, that changed a lot of people's lives. It was like the fucking shark and Jaws. Like I can't go in a pool when it's at night, but you know, in the same with The Exorcist, you're never going to forget that thing. You can't go in a swimming pool at night. What I got my I got problems. You know, yeah. my dark side, is, you know, kind of hobbles Holy me. Macro. I'm mm-hmm. exaggerating a little, but the I ocean. Understand. I'm not going to go in the ocean at night, are you? Yeah, okay. I have. Well, I have, but I mean, it's not comfortable. I, I have a, f- I have a kind of uh, sleepwalker's faith. Yeah. That when I walk out that door, I'm not going to get hit by a car. Oh yeah, I have some of that. You know, that's the only way to live. You've if never you, had moments where you're like, I'm not going to do that because my faith tells me that maybe I shouldn't. I don't remember hmm. anything like that. I usually just follow my instincts. But here's how the exercise yeah. came about. I have to go back. I was asked by a great producer director named Blake Edwards. Sure. Julie Andrews' husband. And, yes, and but Pink more Panthers than that. And, and he had a television series on the air then. He was a great film director. Um, he did Breakfast at Tiffany's. And did he do all stuff. the Pink Panther movies too? The Pink Panther. But that was later, yeah. Pink Panther. But he um, had a series on television then called Peter Gunn. Mm -hmm. which had this great theme by Henry Mancini, which sort of became the foundation of rock and roll. Was Was that it? And this was in the 50s. And then that that Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it was really cool. Yeah. And those were the foundation chords of rock and roll, which came a couple of years later. Uh Uh-huh. And, but Blake was going to make a feature film of Peter Gunn. Yeah. He didn't want to direct it, only to write and produce it. Mm-hmm. And he invited me to meet with him at his offices at Paramount, get the script, read it, and if I liked it, I was going to direct it. I go to the first meeting. I really thought this guy was an absolutely great filmmaker. Yeah. And I lived at the Sunset Marquee then. It was a, it's a little place on Alta Loma off Sunset. Yeah. It's now become more prominent, but then it was like a funky motel with a swimming pool. And um, I lived there. I took the script home, and I read it, and I was v- really disappointed. And I had to sit down and think through what I was going to say to him, because I hated the script. <laughs> mm-hmm. And how was I going to tell this master filmmaker yeah. that? Yeah. And so I went to his office the following Monday and he prepared the same breakfast for me that he always had. It was a it was a English muffin with strawberry jam yeah. and a little pot of tea. And we sat opposite each other and he said, "Well, what did you think?" And I said, "Blake, I think your worst enemy would not have written this script for you. 
this is a terrible piece of shit. That's what you went with? Yeah. Yeah. And I I could only be honest. Yeah. I said, I, I, I hate it. I think what you've done is you've taken two episodes that I remember seeing of Peter Gunn, which I loved on television, and you've sort of spliced them together, and it's not fresh. It's not right. going to be for the movie, right. not for me. Right. And he was a ninth degree black belt karate. <laughs> yeah. He stood up <laughs> yeah. in all of his majesty, uh-huh. and he said to me at the top of his voice, he said, what in the fuck do you know? You don't know anything. What do you know about scripts? You've done a couple of middling to lousy pictures, and I just see some talent in you, and you're telling me about this script? Yeah. I said, Blake, that's how I feel. Uh I'm sure you don't want me to lie to you and then go out and fail. He said, he put out his hand, and he said, thank you very much for letting me meet an interesting person. Mm -hmm. And I left. As I'm leaving... And walking to the parking lot at Paramount, I hear a voice behind me, Mr. Friedkin! And I see a guy running towards me yeah. with dark hair and a mustache, a swarthy complexion. Yeah? Because in Blake's office, which was cavernous, yeah. there were a lot of people sitting in the shadows who I wasn't even introduced to. Uh-huh. And this guy was one of them. Uh-huh. And he introduced himself. He said, Mr. Friedkin, I'm William Peter Blatty. He said, I wrote that script that you just knocked <laughs> yeah. and lost a job. Yeah. And I said, oh, geez, I'm sorry, Mr. Blay. He said, no, no, you're right. Yeah. He said, we all know the script doesn't work. I said, I didn't see your name on it. It just says screenplay by Blake Edwards. He said, yes, Blake often does that. He said, but I wrote the script. Blake did some rewrite on it. But everyone who works for Blake knows it doesn't work. Yeah. And he just wants to get the movie made while he's directing something else. And he said, I admire you for that because you lost a job doing that. And I admire it. He wrote the damn thing. Yeah. We shook hands and then I didn't see him for maybe three or four years. Yeah. Now, three or four years later, I'm on the road doing publicity for the French Connection, which had not come out yet. And I was going to various cities across the country. I started on the East Coast. And before I left the Sunset Marquee, a script arrived, a manuscript arrived in a manila envelope from William Peter Blatty. This is four years later. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, who's, oh, this is the guy that wrote that terrible Peter Gunn script. (laughs) Yeah. I tossed it in my suitcase. And I didn't read it. I went from New York, and I wound up my tour in San Francisco, and then I was going to come back to L.A. And the last night of the tour in San Francisco, I was going to have dinner at 8 o'clock. I had a beautiful view of the whole city out my picture window. And I finished my last interview at 5, and I finally opened this envelope after nine or ten days on the road. Yeah. It's The Exorcist by William Peter Blatty. And I sit down in a very comfortable, easy chair, and I start to read it. (laughs) And I had the same feeling that most of the readers had. It totally zombied me out. Yeah. I couldn't believe this. It was so believable. Yeah, yeah. And I canceled my eight o'clock dinner. I read the whole thing in one sitting. And he had his phone number on the leech, and I called him. And I said, Bill, what the hell? What is this? And he told me (laughs) he was inspired by a story that had happened when he was an undergraduate at Georgetown Mm -hmm. in 1949. Yeah. He had written it as a novel. Yeah. I said, why do you... He said, what do you think? I said, it's great. It's fantastic. He said... Do you want to direct it? I said, well, first of all, why me? He said, because you're the only director I've met who didn't lie to me. (laughs) And he said, but I have to tell you that there are three other directors that Warner Brothers has in mind. They want to give it first to Stanley Kubrick. 
then to Arthur Penn, if Kubrick passes, and then to Mike Nichols. Wow. And he said, so I've got to go through that, but I'd love for you to direct it. Now, the French Connection had not come out yet. It was about to. So those are heavy hitters. Kubrick passed because he said he was only developing his own stuff. Right. Then. Arthur Penn did not want to do any more violence on screen. He had done Bonnie and Clyde. Made his point. Made his point. Yeah. And Mike Nichols thought you could never find a 12-year-old girl who could give a performance that would carry that film. Right. And by the way, when the film did come out, the first call I got was from Mike Nichols, in which he said, how in the hell did you do it? <laughs> and but So now the studio insisted on them. They went through them one at a time, yeah. and then Blatty said, what about Bill Friedkin? They said, no. We, who the hell is Bill Friedkin? Right. He's done a couple of art films, Below the Radar, what the hell? No. And now the three guys pass. They had actually made a deal with another director, who I will not name. They had a deal with him <laughs> to direct Why it. Why would you name him? <laughs> Because I don't want to ago. embarrass him. All right. And, uh, and I know him. And we were friends. Mm -hmm. And he was offered this picture. Yeah. Now, finally, they have hired this other guy. Yeah. And the French connection opened. Okay. And Blatty was still in, so insistent on me because he had director approval. Yeah. And... When they said, no, we're not going to go with Friedkin, he said, okay, Friday night, which is what, the night the French Connection opened, uh -huh. he had not seen it. Right. He said, on Friday night, I'm going on the Johnny Carson show, and I'm going to tell Carson's viewers that you have refused to grant my deal where I get director approval of this picture, and I'm going to tell them that you have broken my deal on national television. Uh -huh. they said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. That day, the French Connection opened in theaters, the f and Blatty was about to take off for Burbank mm -hmm. to do Carson. the Johnny Carson show. Yeah, and he gets a he, uh, he called Frank Wells, who was the head of the studio then. And he said, and Frank said, Bill, he said, is this about Friedkin? And Blatty said, yes, I'm about to drive over to the Carson show. <laughs> and they said, well, Bill, we've seen the French connection, and now we want him more than you do. <laughs> and that's how I got the film. The rest is history. That's a, Yeah, I would say so. Uh, about a month, well, October 30th, I went to Washington, to Georgetown, where the city of Washington, D.C., put up a plaque on those steps where mm -hmm. we filmed yeah. The Exorcist. They put up a plaque officially designating them the Exorcist Steps and designating every October 30th as Exorcist Day. And the mayor of Washington spoke and the president of Georgetown and the city councilman from and I spoke and Blatty spoke and uh, our names are on this plaque and yeah. they were, and it's one of the top five tourist attractions in Washington that movie blew minds and but we never discussed a horror film we never talked about what yeah. we could do to make this scarier it was inspired by a true story. Well, you could feel that because the young priest was so compelling. That guy is a genius. What was that guy's name? Jason Miller. What a great actor. He had never been in a film before. Or don't you think the same? This is all the movie God, yeah. as with French Connection. Yeah. He was perfect for that. Unbelievable. I had originally hired another actor to play that part. But I had si Jason Miller was a playwright. Uh -huh. He had done a few small acting jobs, um, road companies outside of New York, bus tours. But he'd never been in a film and never had a lead in a. It's great. So how and, did you get that performance out of Linda Blair? Well, by becoming like her father, uh -huh. more accurately, her grandfather. Mm. She told me. I asked her. You know, what are the things that moved her the most when she was younger? When I met her, she was yeah. 12. Yeah. 
And she told me that the thing that really uh, destroyed her was the death of her grandfather. And um, But she was highly intelligent. She was a straight-A student. Yeah. Westport, Connecticut. She was a champion horsewoman. She had never acted before. She had only done some modeling, little girls' dresses and stuff in the newspaper. But I talked to her, and uh, I learned a lot about her and her yeah. what she was like growing up yeah. and what scared her and what disturbed her, mm-hmm. the principal thing being the death of her grandfather, yeah. which I would refer to again and again with her. I would go to those things that made her laugh. Off, ca- I'm off camera. Yeah. And before she had to do a scene on camera, I would whisper to her very close to the camera and remind her of things that she had told me. And I became like a surrogate father to her, although either her mother or father or both were on the set at all times. So she but was... I made it a game. Yeah. She was 12 years old. She had no idea of the implications of a lot of the stuff she sure. was doing. right. For example, when I first met her, she said we had seen tapes and interviewed thousands of young girls, and I felt as Mike Nichols did, that you'd never find a 12-year-old yeah. who could do the range of this stuff. Right. And now, uh, I was I was interviewing 16-year-old girls and 17-year-old girls who looked younger uh, to try and find someone who would not be totally destroyed by this. One day when I was... I remember sitting at my desk at Warner Brothers in New York Mm -hmm. at 666 Fifth Avenue, which is where they were located. Mm -hmm. Uh, That address has since... Everything's winding up. Which had since come down, Uh that address. And my head was in my hands because I felt we could not cast this role. I had everybody else. And my secretary buzzes me, my assistant, and says... There's a woman out here named Eleanor Blair, and she's come with her daughter. Yeah. She doesn't have an appointment, but would you see her? Yeah. And I said, sure. Yeah, I'll see her. Why not? The minute she walked in the door, again, like Scheider, it was like a gift from the movie god. I knew it was her. The first thing I look for in an actor of any age, whatever, is not even experience, but intelligence. That's the first thing I'm looking for. Intelligence, which you can sense in someone. Yeah. Even before you speak. Yeah. In the eyes, yeah. in the attitude. She sits down, her mother sits next to her. I said, Linda, do you know anything about The Exorcist? She said, Yeah, I read the book. I said, Well, what's it about? She said, Well, it's about a little girl who um, gets possessed by a devil and she does a whole bunch of bad things. And I said, well, like what? Like, what sort of bad things? And she says, well, she pushes a man out of her bedroom window, and um, she hits her mother across the face, and she masturbates with a crucifix. And I looked at her mother, who was still smiling, and I said, do you know what that means, Linda? She said, what? I said, to masturbate. She said, and they were not a religious family either. But I said, do you know what it means to masturbate? She said, yeah, it's like jerking off, isn't it? I look at her mother, who's still smiling. I said, have you ever done that? Uh-huh. And she said, sure, haven't you? That was it. That was her audition. <laughs> she made it. I knew this was not going to hurt her as a person. Right, right. She was comfortable with the language, comfortable with the ideas, and I made it a game every day on the set. And that movie made a fortune, right? $800 million so far. That's insane. How, how, uh, basically a $3 ticket, but that, much of it has been made through Blu-ray and DVD, reissues, reissues every Halloween, yep. and going back, it was reissued That's constantly, Unbelievable. but also it streams now. Yeah, and, yeah. So what led to Sorcerer? I just want to, because like it's, the way it's characterized in, in some histories of movies is that you made this um, indulgent film that was uh, over budget and you're out of your mind and then when it was released uh, Star Wars buried it and you you went into a hole that's pretty accurate <laughs>
<laughs> That's hey, if you want the short version, you just nailed it. <laughs> But you know when when you finish that movie, because I saw the director's cut, I imagine, and you know when I read about the movie, they didn't seem to realize that there was a gunshot at the end. There's a gunshot at the end. Am no, I right? of the French Connection. No, 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 of the oh, of sorcerer, a gunshot of sorcerer. in sorcerer. Yeah, or it's a truck backfiring because the last thing that you see going through the frame of the long shot of the town outside yeah. the yeah. tavern okay. is. A truck with uh, workers. Yeah, and right going before by. that, you see two and gangsters going in. Two the... gangsters go in, and it's the lady or the tiger ending. Okay, they go in, but he's surrounded by people who owe him their lives. Right, and a couple of sheriffs, mm -hmm. local sheriffs. Yep, and other guys who are armed. Everybody there is armed. Yeah, if not with a gun, with a machete. Mm -hmm. And the question is, can these two gunslingers just take him out and leave hmm. or not? And so you hear what sounds like a gunshot, but could be a truck backfiring. In fact, the sound I used was a truck backfiring. Ah. That sounds like a gun. Okay. At the end of the French Connection, there's an unexplained gunshot. As Hackman runs down the long corridor and makes a turn, still looking for the French guy, yeah. the camera holds on the empty, long basement corridor, and you hear a shot fired, and then it goes to black. Huh. And the ending is in the mind of the viewer. As was the lady or the tiger. I really had a hard time processing, uh, what, you know, if 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 Scheider died at the end of Sorcerer, like you should. I, you it is up to the viewer. You should have a hard time. But processing I, 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 I didn't even indulge the truck by backfiring. I just figured he got it. That's okay. You welcome to your opinion. It bothered me. Uh, I don't know if he died or not. I know you don't. It's, but you, I you don't thought show, about it. If I don't show it. Okay. It doesn't exist. But you weighed this decision. You put the sound in for this The sound reason. of a truck backfiring, which you interpreted as a gunshot. All right. I like to have my films go into the mind of the viewers and let them process it or not. Did you lose your mind during Shooting Sorcerer? Uh, that might be too strong a way yeah. to characterize it. I was always in control of it. Yeah. And I always tried to get what I envisioned on the screen. Did you? A yes. And as a film that came the closest to the way I saw it, my mind's eye, that's the one. I loved it. Well, I thank you. It reflected my view of life, as I told you. And this is just, the, the, was the Vietnam War still going? Or just over? It was uh, it was o basically over mm -hmm. a couple of years. Nixon had basically ended the Vietnam right. War. You know, Vietnam reverberated throughout this country and to some extent still does. And I think that at that time in the mid-70s to the late 70s, America, it, it, not so much that it lost its way, but it certainly became a new country. You know, after the 70s. America went through a national nervous breakdown after the assassinations of the yep. Kennedy brothers yep. and Martin Luther King mm -hmm. and the Vietnam War. Yep. That took America through a national nervous breakdown. Um, and that was sort of the sorcerer, sort of the end of that in a way. The sorcerer in many ways reflected that. Uh, these men doing absolutely stupid things uh, which may or may not have resulted in their survival, and in fact, three out of the four of them don't survive. Yeah. Um, and but they were desperate. Like I tried to picture that movie coming out and what an audience at that time and how they would receive it. Well, it wasn't well received by the critics or the audience. There, I can't believe the critics. What kind of critics would not receive that well? The same critics that re re rejected Citizen Kane right. and Vincent van Gogh, mm -hmm. who never sold a painting in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. I'm not comparing myself to Vincent right. van Gogh by any means, but he made over 36 or 3,700 works, drawings, watercolors, mm -hmm. oil paintings. You look at them today, you say, 
This man died without ever selling one of these? And today, you, it would cost you $100 million if you yep. could buy an oil painting. There was a great story. Why? What changed in the tastes of the art-loving public that were buying the Impressionists at the time of Van Gogh, yep. but not a Vincent? This is a, an outrageous mystery of fate not faith as i mentioned earlier but fate why didn't those people back then recognize this as the great art that it is uh -huh. i have no idea and that movie was about fate sorcerer is about the mystery of fate yes when sorcerer released and star wars released were you were you mad no i mean uh I was unprepared for that radical a shift in the zeitgeist, yeah. and it was. It was a, a, a major change. It was like from silent movies to sound. Did you know Lucas? Yes. I met Lucas when he used to serve the food at Francis Coppola's house <laughs> uh, that Ellie, his, Francis's wife, used to cook, mm -hmm. and Lucas was a kind of acolyte. Yeah. W employed by Francis, uh -huh. and Francis had uh, given Lucas some money for THX, and, uh, THX, yeah. and some help. And he he was an assistant to Francis, and he would serve dinners at Francis's house in San Francisco. Then, mm. and then Francis backed him in American Graffiti after uh, uh, THX and. Here comes American Graffiti. And the guy who ran the studio, they had a preview of American Graffiti that Francis sort of grandfathered. Yeah. He had to be there in case Lucas didn't know how to make a movie. And they have a preview in San Francisco where they all lived. And the guy who ran Universal is a guy named Ned Tannen. And after the screening where the audience went wild, loved it, Screaming, cheering, out in the hall at, at the theater, Ned Tannen says to Coppola and Lucas, he said, you guys let me down. He says, that's not the film we talked about. This doesn't work. we got to be in the cutting room Monday morning. This was at the North Point Theater in San Francisco. It's now gone. And he said, you know, I don't know where this went wrong, but it's, it's wrong everywhere, and we got to go in the cutting room and fix it. And Francis said, you don't know what you're talking about. Did you hear that audience? Did you see the audience in there? They went crazy for this. What is wrong with you? He said, how much money have you got in this picture? And Tess, what do you mean? How, I don't, how much? He said, how much money do you have in the picture? You don't have a million dollars in this picture. He said, what do you have, about 900000 at the most? And Tannen said, yeah, that's about right. And Francis whipped out his checkbook, <laughs> and he said, I will buy this film from you right now. I will write you a check for $900,000 and take this over. And he didn't have $900,000 or anything like it. But Tannen backed off, uh -huh. and the film went out the way George made it. Uh, you know... When you talk about a mentor or, or a guy who was an inspiration to another filmmaker, that's Coppola and Lucas. And, of course, they went down separate sure. paths. But you, So you, you sense with Star Wars that it was just a shift in the culture. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, it, that's rarely happened. It happened at times when, you know, color, black and white gave way to color mm -hmm. and uh, silent gave way to sound. Mm. Well, there's nothing wrong with the great Buster Keaton and Chaplin sure. movies, but along comes sound, which in many ways was a regression of the art form. But that's what people wanted. They wanted sound to go with that. And you thought picture. it was that big of a shift? Without a doubt. That's what it is today. Yeah. Star Wars came out in 1977, Damn but man. every other film is an offshoot of Star Wars. Right. All these comic book superheroes. Sure. That's Star Wars. If Star Wars had failed, I don't know which direction film would have gone to. Well, where did you go? I stayed on the path that I had but set right myself right after Sorcerer, on. after, you know, I, I imagine there was a, a period where you were like, I got to get my head together. Uh, yeah, but 
I've always thought of myself, really, not as an artist, but as a, a working director. Where'd you go? I made. Uh, uh, I didn't make a film for a while. I didn't find anything I really wanted to do. But uh, almost two years later, I made a film called The Brinks Job. Mm -hmm. It was intended as a comedy about the actual Brinks robbery. Right. Peter Falk, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Sorvino, um, uh, uh, Peter Boyle, yeah. Warren Oates, ah, Warren Oates, Jenna Rowland, yeah. Alan Garfield, and we had a lot of fun. And I went to Boston to make it because I was a huge Celtic fan. Oh yeah, and I got to know Red Arback uh -huh. and very well. And for the next ten years, I basically went to Celtics games and practices. And I and eventually they let me practice. Oh yeah, with the the eighties team, uh -huh. Bird, Bird, McHale, and Parrish. Oh yeah. And I got to suit up, and I could run the plays. I could never rebound right. with those guys, but I became very close to Red and Bob Cousy. Oh, that's great. And what about cruising? That blew my mind in high school. That was a couple of years later. It's a crazy movie. That came about, I'm, I don't know if you know this, when I made The Exorcist, there's a scene, it's an arteriogram scene. Yeah. You know, where they try to... Uh, where they put a needle oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in a neurosurgical right. room, yeah. and they inject a fluid that outlines the arteries of the brain yeah. to see if she has arterial brain damage. Mm -hmm. And I shot that scene at the NYU, the New York University Medical Center, yeah. with an actual neurosurgeon and his assistant. And I noticed something about the assistant then. This was back... In 1972, mm -hmm. when I shot it. Yeah. The assistant, who was a male nurse, in effect, had an earring and a studded leather bracelet yeah. in the workplace. And that was rare, and especially in a hospital mm -hmm. setting. And mm -hmm. I, I just, I didn't comment to anybody about it. I just took note of it as being strange. His name was Paul Bateson. He's in the movie. Yeah. About uh, four years later, f five years later, I read on the front page of the New York Daily News, I see Paul Bateson's picture. And he's charged with several murders of gay men who... Body parts were found in the East River of New York in plastic bags. And I see it's, who is this guy? Paul Bateson. I know this guy. And, oh my God. And I read on, I see he's being held at Rikers Island. And I see the name of his lawyer. And I find he's being held because when these body parts came to surface in these plastic bags... In very small print at the bottom of the bag, it said New York University Medical Center Neuropsychological Neuropsychiatric Division. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how they traced the bags and the parts to him, and they charged him. So I call his lawyer, whose name was in the paper, I didn't know, and I said, look, I directed The Exorcist, and, and Paul is in it. He said, yeah, I know. I said, would would Paul see me, or would you allow uh, Paul to meet with me? Yeah. He said, I'll ask him. And the answer came back, yes. And I had to go through about eight layers of bureaucracy to get into where he was being held pending trial for several murders. And I'm uh, sitting with him in a room as big as this one. As I say, it's about uh, 15 10, by 10 by 15, yeah. approximately. Uh-huh. And I'm in a room with him, and there's a guard outside, not inside. Yeah. And we sit down. This is 1978 or so. The Exorcist has been out for five years. And Paul says to me, first thing he says is, yeah. how's the film doing? <laughs> and I said, well, it's doing great, Paul. It's still running. Uh -huh. And I said, Paul, did you do these murders? And he said... I only remember doing the first one. He said, I was so high. 
on the rest of these, I honestly don't remember. But I probably did, because they got me on these bags. And the first murder was actually the theater critic for Variety in New York. His name was Addison Varill. Yeah. And Paul used to go to the S&M bars on the west side of New York. He'd pick up guys, take them back to his apartment. They'd do a lot of dope. And he'd wind up hitting them over a head with a frying pan, and then he cut them up and threw their bodies in these bags in the East River. And he remembered doing the first one, but he told me he didn't remember all the rest. I said, how many were there? He said, I'm not sure. He said, but they've asked me to confess to eight. And they have said, if I confess to eight, they will lower my sentence and... I'll get out in 25 years. I said, for eight murders? Yeah. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I don't know. I'm thinking about it. He confessed to the eight murders and got out 25 years later. He's around somewhere. He may be listening to this broadcast. I'm sure he went into witness protection. I don't know if he's still alive or still uses the name Paul Bateson. But that's who he was, and that's what gave me the idea for the film Cruising. And that and that movie that was, was taking place. Not only these murders in the S and M bars, but the mysterious deaths of gay people, mm -hmm. which did not have a name in nineteen seventy eight, but by nineteen eighty when Cruising came out, it was HIV yeah. AIDS. So there were these mysterious deaths and murders. And there were articles by a guy called Arthur Bell in the Village Voice who wrote, you know, sort of warning shots to gay people about not going to these bars. And I happened to know the guy who was the head of the West Side mob, the Italian mob yeah. in New York, who owned all the bars. And... He owned the mine shaft where mm -hmm. I on Little West Twelfth Street. Yeah. It's now a gentrified restaurant yeah. area in the West Side of yeah, New York. Yeah, like Gansvert Street. Yeah. He owned the bars, and I went to him to his house. He lived like Tony Soprano. Yeah. He's a big fan of the in French Jersey? Connection. No, he lived in Long Island. Yeah. And he had his grandchildren sure. running around on the floor while we sat in the kitchen, and he would cut up pieces of salami. And we and cheese, and mm -hmm. we'd eat salami and cheese and talk about stuff. And one day I said to him, his name was Matty Ionello, mm -hmm. Mar Matty the Horse. Mm -hmm. And I said, Matty, I want to talk to you. I want to make a film in the mine shaft. Yeah. And he went like this. He put his finger in front of his mouth, yeah. like, shh. Yeah. And he held his hand out, stop. Don't say another word. And then he said, so you're working on another film, huh, kid? And he changed the subject, went to something else. And then we talked for about another 15, 20 minutes. We go outside. He said, I'll walk you to your car. We walk out of the house toward my car. He first walked me in the opposite direction because where my car was parked, he said, you see, he said, without moving his lips, he said, you see down the street there? You see that uh, little uh, dark Ford sitting mm -hmm. down there? There's two guys sitting down there, and they've got uh, binoculars on us. So they're going to try to read our lips. So we're going to go this other way for a minute. He said, first of all, never talk about my business in my house. Never say a word about my business in my house. Now, what do you want? And I said, I want to shoot in the mine shaft. He said, don't write this down. I'm going to give you a name and a phone number. You remember this number? And he gave me the phone number and the name of the guy who managed the mine shaft for him. And he said, call him and tell him you spoke to me. He will have heard from me. So I called the guy a few days later, went down, met with him, and I had permission to film in these bars with the guys who were members of this club. There were no actual extras. They were guys into this. They were, a lot of them were members of a group called the FFA, the Fist Fuckers of America. Uh -huh. 
and and this was a private club, and I filmed there for oh at least a week. A lot of stuff I filmed I couldn't use in the final cut. Yeah, it was a heavy movie, man. The story was heavy. And, you know, a lot of people came out at the time and said this is anti-gay. And it absolutely was not. It was... It was Specific. A, it was an unusual background yeah. for a murder mystery. That's yeah. the only way I had viewed it. Now, I had also made Boys in the Band some years earlier... Yeah. And a lot of people thought that was anti-gay. It was written by a gay man. It's a great play. Yeah. Very funny. I think the movie we made is terrific. And I think Cruising in its own way is damn good. Yeah. But it, these were obviously not anti-gay films, but they were a peek behind the curtain of a culture that not too many people anywhere were aware of. Right. Most of the reaction to cruising has changed as well. It's mostly positive. I remember when To Live and Die in L.A. came out because uh, I was uh, excited that you made a new movie. Again, it was about the thin line between the policeman and the criminal. Yep. Or between good and evil. And that's my subject. What was basically. that guy? Was that Peterson? Billy Peterson. Oh, my God. It was his first film. That's the first time I ever saw him. First film. He had a walk on as a bartender in Michael Mann's movie Thief, which yeah. he shot in Chicago. Yeah. But I saw him up at the Toronto Shakespeare Festival. The same guy that brought me Roy Scheider said, you got to go up and see this guy, Billy Peterson, do Streetcar Named Desire at the Toronto Shakespeare Festival. And I said, I don't want to see Streetcar. Marlon Brando <laughs> owns that part. <laughs> yeah. Everyone who's ever yeah. done it just imitates Brando. Yeah. And he said, this guy does not. He is unique and original. And I go up there. I saw the performance. Guy was great. I met with him. offered him the picture. It's interesting now that I'm realizing it, that you've always had a relationship with theater in the films. That, like, you know, even with Boys well, in the Band. that's where actors Bertrand. come from, Mark. No, but I mean, like, you shoot, you shoot plays. I've done a couple. I did Boys in the Band, The Birthday Party. And uh, but the recent Bug ones. and Killer Joe. But, th but you know, these are, these are your most recent films. Great um, scripts. Tracy Letts is a genius. Well, these are great. Well, we're on the same page. What that, page is that? that? We have the same worldview. We look at life in a similar way, what? sort of with an ironic view, but we are obviously disturbed by the same sorts of things, and we we see that, you know, there is this mystery of fate that's a part of life, and also that People often do stupid things unintentionally. That's what the point of view is? That's one of them. It's a, to, when I say we're on the same page, you and I are probably on the same page. Yep. I don't know what your politics are, and I don't care, but I imagine we have a similar outlook. I don't think either one of us suffers fools gladly. Right. Uh, that's where Tracy and I that's the point at which we meet. But we don't believe, you know, the codes. Right. We don't believe the codes. Well, what about, like, in terms of the emotions and the, the, the visceral and violent nature and the sexuality of these plays? And, 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 and they're very, you know, it's, it's not easy to shoot a play as a film, I would imagine, because the script and the pace is different. Correct? Well, if it's a great script, it really doesn't matter. And you're shooting on digital, right? I shot. I shoot now on digital, yes. You have no problem with that? No, it's great. <laughs> when they release the picture, yeah. it has no dirt, no yeah. scratches, yeah. no splices. Yeah. You can tune, you can go into a frame of film and tune the color. You can make the sky bluer or lighter blue. You can make... Uh, people's faces warmer or colder, stuff you could never do from frame to frame with 35 millimeter. So yes, I love it. And by the way, over 90%, 95% or more of all the screens run only digital. No, I know, film. I know. I just like, like, I guess I romanticize the, the, uh, the, the commitment necessary, uh, budgetarily and, 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 and technology wise. To, uh, to, to film. Most 35 millimeter films are not in good shape enough to be seen. I know. It's like, you want to hear,
Caruso sing on an old 78 RPM record? No. And his voice sounds like this. With needle scratch? Yeah. That's what 35 millimeter is compared to a digital print. Right. Or something that you stream on your computer or iPad or iPhone in 1080 uh, IP, high definition. It's beautiful, I think. And 35 mil. I've seen prints of my films. You know, Quentin Tarantino's guy I like very much. He ha- owns a theater. Yeah, New Beverly. Yeah, and he runs only 35s. And I've given him prints. He actually had bootleg prints of a lot of my stuff. And he calls me and asks me if it's okay to run them there. And I say, yes, as long as I don't have to be there and see it. Yeah. Because 35s suck. <laughs> It's like listening to a podcast versus listening to radio on a tiny little AM thing thing that you yeah. used to plug into the wall right. and had nothing but static. Yeah. All right. I understand that. So I want the film to be seen as I see it through the viewfinder of the camera. I don't want the projectionist to have final cut. Mm-hmm where the film breaks in the projector as it often used to, and he'd have to splice it, and you lose frames. Every time you run a 35-millimeter picture on a projector, it picks up dirt and scratches and often splices. And that was not built in. Yeah. But I know that there are a lot of people who feel, hell, that's what the way I saw it. That's the purest way. I Bullshit. <laughs> I want to see it clean. So these two plays you did with Let's, um, we uh, I brought it up earlier. There's a couple of things I want to bring around in terms of working with actors because it seems like sometimes when you work with someone like Tommy Lee Jones that you 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 trust his instincts, he trusts his instincts. But there are other actors that you feel like you have to get in their head, uh, as we talked about with uh, Gene, with Gene, and also Linda Blair a bit. And uh, but like you know, I noticed like right away when I was watching Bug. You know, and I don't want to give short shrift to some of the other movies like Jade or whatever. Oh, but, right. but uh you, you know, that was one of the best things I ever saw her do. Oh, she's great in Bug, and she understood that paranoia. Bug is about the ability of two people who are who become romantically involved, and one person passes not only their worldview and their good stuff, but all their bad vibes to the other person, right. and their paranoia. It's about mutual paranoia, and it's deeply disturbing and involving. The actors were great, everybody in it. Well, that guy... Uh, uh, Michael Shannon. Wow, what a, he's he something. Was, he nailed it, and Ashley nailed it. And a lot of it comes from, in her case, the way she grew up. Mm-hmm feelings that she had that I was able to tap into, but mostly she instinctively knew who that woman was. She had never been able to play anything like that. Like Matthew McConaughey in Killer Joe, she had mostly done romantic comedies and sort of women's thrillers. And with those performances, like when you have these conversations with actors, do you do you sit down at a quiet place? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, some really comfortable place. Uh You know, we don't do it in a restaurant or something. We'll sit down in a quiet room, often at my house, Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally at their house. I first talked to McConaughey about Killer Joe at his house Mm -hmm. then out in Malibu. He's he's moved to Austin, Texas. Back. Yeah, I think he grew up there, didn't he? He Yeah. from there? Yeah. He's from East Texas. Yeah. And... The first time Matthew read Killer Joe, he told me, and he said it publicly, he threw it across the room into a big trash bin he had in his room. Yeah. He hated it. And then the people that gave it to him said, wait, you hated it? You better read this again. He said, his agent and his lawyer said to him, you grew up with these guys. You know who these people are, and this is the different role that you're looking for, and it's in its own way, it's funny. Yeah. It's really darkly humorous. Uh-huh. And so he read it again, he said, and he got it. He got it. And he called me and we met and we talked a little bit about how my approach to it. I said, I don't do take two unless a 
a light falls in the shot or the camera tips over. I, there is no take two. Always you, or just with these? Always. I don't do take two. Uh, you know, uh, let alone what a lot of take 37. I used to, like every other swinging dick, you yeah. know, that made a movie. I used to do endless takes looking for a miracle. Yeah. And I'd get in the cutting room. You're looking for a miracle on about take 27. <laughs> and I'd get in the cutting room and... uh uh, I'd see that the best takes were the first or second one, the most spontaneous. They might not be word for word perfect, but they had the spontaneity. And so I tell the actors, now, that's what I'm going for. So we talk over the scene. What is this scene about? And then I give them a staging, how I'm going to do it. And I'll, I'll sometimes use metaphor in talking to an actor, yeah, or I'll say things like, let's do it faster or slower, uh, or, uh, you know, um, let's do it more quietly or louder. I've often done that, but I don't stand there and try to bang out takes. Many directors have said, and I agree with, what's the secret of directing? Casting. Yeah. If you've cast the right people and you're on the same page with them, it's probably going to work. Yeah. So let's get back and close with this. The uh, You said you've seen The Shroud of Turin. Oh, yeah. Now, you know, given your fascination with Jesus and given your fascination with the story, and you've obviously done a lot of research and uh, uh, have interest in it, what's what's your feelings on The Shroud of Turin? I, when I first directed the opera Aida, mm -hmm at the Teatro Reggio in Torino about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. I met a, You meet a lot of people socially when you come in as the director of an opera. They yeah. call you maestro. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the people who control the Shroud of Turin are not the Catholic Church, but the relatives of the Savoy kings who originally owned the Shroud of Turin uh, in uh, France, where they had their monarchy. And in the third century, they moved and built a castle in Torino and a basilica. And in that basilica, they brought with them from third century France the shroud that is allegedly the garment in which Jesus was wrapped when he was taken off the cross and placed in the tomb of owned by Joseph of Arimathea. That's the allegation. I met the last remaining relative of the Savoya family. His name is Serge de Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. Serge of Yugoslavia. Yeah. He's a nice guy. He yeah. was in his 40s then, yeah. young, attractive. I think he was in the stock market you know, in, in Italy and in various investments. And we met and became good friends. The Shroud had not been shown to the public for over a 100 years. And he had control of who saw it. And uh, I used to pull his leg. I say, Serge, I lived in an apartment right across from the Basilica. Uh -huh. And I used to say, Serge, you got to show me the Shroud. I'm dying to see the Shroud, knowing I'd never get to see it. Right. It had not been open to the public. Yeah. One day, after weeks of this, where I'm basically putting him on, yeah. he calls me on a Thursday, and he said, on Saturday, after the noon mass, you're not rehearsing, are you? I said, no, or I said something like, I'll move the rehearsal if I have to. Yeah. He said, meet me right after the noon mass, wear a black suit, meet me on the steps of the basilica, tell Sherry to wear a black pants suit, not a dress, and to cover her head. And he said, you wear a tie and meet me on the steps of the Basilica Saturday. I said, Serge, I don't have a black suit and I don't have a tie. He said, you have a dark coat? Yes. Dark pants? Yes. Wear that and I'll bring you a tie. We go to the steps of the Basilica. The noon mass lets out and there is Serge and his mother, who lives in Florida. And his mother had a new boyfriend. She wasn't that old. Mm -hmm. 
and she wanted to show the shroud to her new boyfriend, and they both live in Florida. So Serge arranged this private showing for eight people to which Sherry and I were invited. After the noon mass had completely let out, a big black limousine came around the corner with the Bishop of Piemonte, the region, the Piedmont or Piemonte Mm -hmm. region, and two or three priests accompanying him. And Serge said to us, you will have to kiss his ring. And we kissed the ring, both of us. And then we went inside to the empty basilica. And as you walk toward the rather ornate altar, on the left-hand side is a long um, room covered from inside, outside with leaded glass and from inside with velvet drapes that remained shut for a hundred years, unless guys would go in there. And Serge handed the keys to this room to the bishop, who opened the doors. They rolled back the drapes, and now we are in a room that was probably twice as big as this room, 15 by 10. It's probably 30 by 20. And the only thing you see in the room is just to the left of the altar. The only thing you see in the room is a painting of Jesus, and I don't know who it was by. It does not seem to be a well-known or famous portrait. Uh And you see a rug. And the priests, there are eight of us, and the priests roll back the rug, and there's a foot pedal. And the bishop placed his foot on the pedal at Serge's invitation, and up from the floor rises this table that's about 15 feet long. And it was covered... After the rug is rolled back, it's covered by a red velvet um, cloth with an embroidered gold crucifix. And they roll that back, and beneath leaded glass on the table is the outline of a crucified man in blood. And the most current DNA has shown that and they're pretty good with the DNA now, that that image of the crucified man is not paint, certainly not photography, because its existence has been known since the 3rd century. Photography goes back to the 19th century. It, in fact, is type AB blood. And it's an outline of a crucified man, including the outline of a crown of thorns, and there's a outline of blood in the chest where the centurion spear is supposed to have gone. And you're looking at the image of a crucified man whose uh, uh, palms are crossed, but they have been nailed through. And his ankles are crossed and with one nail through both ankles. You see the outlines in blood of this image. And my wife and I and everyone else in the room burst into tears. As I think of it now, my eyes tear up. And we see what is the image of a crucified man. In other words, we see before us, man's inhumanity to man. Bang! I don't know if it's Jesus. The latest DNA has shown that the pollen on this uh, cloth is from first century Jerusalem. Now, the Romans crucified thousands of people. Many of them called Jesus. We don't know that this is Jesus. I don't know that there were that many people, or not, crucified with a crown of thorns. This I didn't and don't know. But I know that there were other Jesuses crucified. My wife and I, who are both Jewish, burst into uncontrollable tears. And 
because of the power of this image. And then the bishop in Italian, translated by Serge to us, started to explain the images in a, in a clear way. And it turns out that when you photograph, if you, if we weren't, I didn't ask to photograph it, but if someone photographs this image, it doesn't show up. It only showed when it was, when the negative had been photographed. And the photograph of the negative looks like this. This is it. Yeah. I carry it with me. And that's the image that you get when you reproduce the negative. The positive image does not photograph. But when you look at it by eye, you see this outline in blood of a crucified man. Yeah. And d d now, a few weeks or possibly a month or so later, Bishop John Paul II wanted to see the shroud. And he had to get permission from the Savoia family through the Bishop of Piemonte. And he, of course, was allowed to come and see the shroud. And there were hundreds of thousands of people outside waiting for him to appear outside the basilica. And he came out and he said words to the effect in Italian that this is a very important relic of the Catholic Church. He did not say for certain that this is the shroud of Jesus. He did not say that this was definitely what is claimed for it. He said it's a very important relic of the Catholic faith, and it should be seen by everybody. So they then opened it to the public. This is about 10, 12 years ago, and over 2 million people filed by. This was shortly before Turin got the Winter Olympics. And then when I went back there to redirect the opera, Aida, uh, in October, it had been reopened again, 10, 12 years later. More millions of people filed by, but I didn't go in then because I, I had been alone with that image. You felt the opening of the original magic. You know, that moment, how are you going to recapture that moment? Never. See, like to me, with the way you described it, and whether it was real or it wasn't, the the mystical implications and the historical, I I'm going to call it magic, of 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 what it represents and what it could possibly be, and just the the procedural that went up to you experiencing it, was mind blowing. Jesus did not want to be thought of as a magician, and did not want to be thought of as someone who performed miracles. He was always quick to tell the people where these so-called miracles occurred, do not say anything, do not talk about this. He didn't want to be thought of as a magician or a, 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 a role player. Now, it's possible to interpret from that that if I tell you, hey, Mark, don't say anything about what we talked about, <laughs> that the first thing you're going to do is go tell somebody. That's possible. Uh -huh. But... Uh, you know, what draws me to the ideas of Jesus is not the miracles no. uh, or the the supernatural. Right. What draws me are the ideas, the thoughts that are expressed in his word, in his name. None of the other stuff upon which the religion is built, you know, being born uh, uh, of a virgin birth, None of that is real experience. But, you know, I tell you that the mystery of faith just blows me away. Yeah. No one saw this man. That, and by the way, in those days, in the time of Jesus, not only single women, but married women preached the gospel of Jesus. And today they can't be priests. And this great new pope they have, this liberal pope, I am hoping that he will change that. Because women preached the gospel in the time of Jesus. 
Mary Magdalene, for example, only one example. Do you consider yourself a Christian? No. No. I consider myself a believer in the teachings of Jesus. I, I, I do, n- I think the ritual is beautiful. I find myself, as I photograph the Mass in The Exorcist with Jason Miller saying the Mass in a big close up, calmly and quietly and deeply felt, that's how I feel about it. When I went to church to prepare for filming The Exorcist, the priests would uh, rattle off the Mass like it was rap poetry. In nomine Patria, Patria, Spiritus Sanctus, you couldn't hear the words. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy God. Blah, blah. I had Jason Miller say, Take this cup and drink from it. For this is my blood, the blood of the everlasting covenant, the mystery of faith. He said it over and over again, quietly, slow in a close up. And you see the wafer, and he said, For this is my body. Take this and eat of it, which is this ritual of the Mass. But I broke those phrases down to their essential meaning because they moved me so powerfully that I, he was playing a priest saying Mass, and I didn't want him to rattle it off like a rap record. It was amazing talking to you. Mark, I I look forward to this. I knew, because I've heard many of your podcasts, and you're in a class by yourself. I'm not kissing your ass. Everybody who's listening to this knows that. And I don't do this anymore. It was great. I don't do... Uh, I appreciate that. I don't do interviews. I've done it. I've said everything, basically, I have to say. They're usually the same questions accompanied mm-hmm. by the same answers. Because I can turn my brain on autopilot, but not when I'm talking to you. I thought it was great. Thank you, Mark. I'm honored you came Thanks by. for inviting me. It's Thanks pleasure. for coming, Bill. That's what you call a rock and tour, my friends. That's a story. A long story woven together by a series of stories and life experiences threaded through fate. I'd like to thank William Friedkin for being here. That was an honor and a pleasure. As a small business owner, does the thought of missing inbound calls make you cringe? People connecting with your customers is critical to your success. And if you can't answer their calls, someone else will. That's where the folks at Ruby Receptionists come in. Their friendly, professional receptionists answer 100% of your calls live during business hours, providing excellent service that helps grow your business. Get started today at callruby.com slash WTF and get free activation, a $95 value. You can also go to WTFpod.com for all your WTF pod needs. Got a bunch of posters up there. Got stuff. Get on the mailing list. Check the episode guide. It's actually WTFpod.com slash guide. To see who's been on the show, get hooked up with the Howl app for our archive. And I'm just going to play a little guitar. I know you've been through a lot. That was a long show.